be the key to their success today on offense. The Stallions have assigned Kenny Watson to cover Gerald Wilcox three straight years over 1,000 yards receiving. On the other side of the field, if the Bombers are to have any chance today, they've got to stop this man, Mike Pringle. Two straight years leading the CFL in rushing. Two straight years he has been the most outstanding player in the Southern Division of the CFL. James and Chris, great rivalry this. Winnipeg and Baltimore shaken today by news here in Baltimore that the NFL Cleveland Browns are set to move here next year. There's a news conference that has been called for Monday, at which time we expect Browns owner Art Modell to make the statement. James, how might this affect the Stallions in this game? Well, it really shouldn't affect the players at all. They have one purpose come this time of the year, and that is to make it to the Grey Cup. So their goal is to go out and win this first playoff game this afternoon. Might be an opening psychologically for the Bombers, Chris. They're getting better winning three of their last four games. They think they have another psychological edge here. I know Gerald Wilcox and many of the Bombers feel Baltimore's looking by Winnipeg today, and uh, they're going to try and feed on that this afternoon. Much different team than the club that met Baltimore back in July when Baltimore won 43-7. to Now Reggie Slack is in charge of the offense. Great week last week against Ottawa, 73 yards rushing. And on defense, KD Williams has taken charge, and he'll have to play a big role today in stopping Mike Pringle of Baltimore. Well, when you look at this Baltimore team, the biggest improvement on this team this year came on special teams. Chris Wright set a single-season record for return yards this year, and he really improved that aspect of the team for his field position goal. But you look at the punter, Josh Miller, a 42.2-yard net this year, led the league, and Carlos worked to pick up an expansion draft from Las Vegas, second in the league in scoring with 228 points. Interesting irony in this game. Cal Murphy, the only GM to vote against the North-South playoff format that allows his team, fifth best in the North, to be the fourth playoff first team in the South and have a playoff life. Back to you, Scott, in Calgary. Okay, Mark, there's no place a player would rather be at this time of year than in the playoffs, but second to that, I suppose, is working with us, and so we welcome, uh, welcome Argonaut quarterback Kent Austin, who will not be called upon to answer for all that went wrong in the Argo season today because we're only Thanks. on the air for... Uh, for six hours. <laughs> but Kent, you got Grey Cup rings with Saskatchewan 88, BC last year, and both marches to the Cup, you pulled off upsets all along the way. So the Bombers need only look at recent history to know they have a chance today. They've got a chance, a slim chance in my opinion, but the only chance they have is to get a great game out of Reggie Slack. Not only throwing the ball, but Reggie has to be an effective rusher today against a great a Baltimore defense. Yeah, he could be their most effective rushing right. weapon. And later, it's the 15 and three Stampeders against the Tie Cats here in Calgary. You can appreciate the Stamps are a touch nervous here. Well, they may be a touch nervous, but I don't expect Calgary to fall today. Uh, they've got a lot to prove, and they've got character guys on their team and great athletes, and I think they'll come through today. Now, Doug Flutie gets the start today. Are you surprised at the speed of his recovery from elbow surgery? I'm really surprised. Uh, I don't know what the explanation is, other than maybe the injury wasn't as serious, or Doug's just a great recoverer uh, on, on injuries like that. But uh, it's, a, it's a lift for the Calgary Stampeders to have him back in the lineup. Would you be shocked to see him rear back and throw it 60 yards on a rope? No, I wouldn't be surprised. Not with Doug. All right, Kent, we'll talk to you frequently throughout the day. Coming up at halftime on our Chrysler Canada halftime report today, and we're happy to welcome a new sponsor to the playoffs. We'll look ahead to the North semifinal here in Calgary. We'll hear from Stampeder starting quarterback Doug Flutie and the leader of the Hamilton defense, Mike O'Shea. He and his mates are heavy underdogs in this game. We'll analyze the first half of the Baltimore-Winnipeg semifinal at Memorial Stadium where the Stallions and Bombers are ready to begin sorting out which of the two advances to the South Division final. Here again is Mark Lee. Thank you, Scott, and they have kept the natural grass field here at Memorial Stadium, covered by a tarp all week. It is a dry, fast track, just the way Mike Pringle likes it, but it's cool and it's windy. Only 8 degrees, the wind's gusting up to 32 kilometers per hour. It could be trouble for the kickers here today. They were chanting CFL, CFL, CFL. They're rev for the kickoff. We're just about ready to go. Here's Chris and James. All right, Mark, thanks very much. And you know Cal Murphy, more than anyone else in Canada, would love to keep an American-based team out of the Grey Cup. While on the other side, Don Matthews brings his team into this Southern semifinal on a 10-game winning streak, but said that won't necessarily help them in this semifinal game. Chris Wright, after a little confusion with Tui Peloto, has the ball, and Winnipeg will drop them deep to start the game. Brendan Rodgers, always great on specialty teams with the tackle, so Winnipeg will start with the wind at their back, but in a bit of a hole to start this game with Tracy Ham at controls of the offense. Number one in the CFL on, on the ground this year. There are the passing stats for Ham and Baltimore, despite the 15-3 record, James, 
is last in passing statistics, but they don't beat themselves. Well, it's a team that depended heavily upon the run this year, and when you run the ball so consistently, it's hard to get your passing game in sync. First play from scrimmage, and no surprise, Mike Pringle will try the left side. There's Katie Williams making the tackle at the 15-yard line, and it's a pickup of close to four. Mike Withicombe is the top Five offensive lineman the in the South this down year, down and the these five, a big reason why Mike Pringle, the leading rusher once again in the Canadian Football League, and Gerald Alphen, the former Blue Bomber, is in a slot back position, hoping to come back to hunt Cal Murphy and the Blue Bombers this afternoon. Second down five, flag goes down as Ham drops back, great protection. There's Alphen, and he can't bring it in. Incomplete on the first pass attempt of the game to Alphen. And again, a penalty marker on the play. But those are the passes that you have to hit. You have a wide open yep. Gerald Alphen downfield. One of the things with Tracy Ham. Outside, both for number 86. That penalty is declined. Third down. Is that Tracy has a reputation of gambling. He's not one of those quarterbacks who want to nickel and dime you down the field. So he has to be more patient. And that way he'll pick up the passing tempo for the offense. Robert Clark was offside. Tracy Ham and Reggie Slack may have to battle a swirling wind today that gave both the kickers problems in the warm-up. Well, Josh Miller has the wind at his back, and he led the league in punting this year. And he blasts this one downfield. Wilbert Biggins in the game for Winnipeg as a return man today. Stopped immediately. You talked about net punting of Josh Miller this year. This was 46 yards, just two yards on the return. Great team defensive pursuit and, and the net yardage as we get a look at Reggie Slack right here is the key he gets the hang time on his kicks well there is Reggie Slack now at the controls for the past six games actually made his bomber debut back in July in a relief role against Baltimore but he's really putting his stamp on this offense well he really has in the last six games Reggie has really taken control of this bomber offense and he has become their leader in the last six games he's passed for 1581 yards and He's become the guy that they've come to rally around. James, the Bombers' game plan clearly is to try and establish a ground game against Baltimore early, and that includes the running ability of Slack. Well, in establishing that running game, they're going to have to be able to run in between the tackles. When they go outside, Slack has to carry the mail. Blaze Bryant, the running back, and he'll take the handoff, and not much doing right up the middle. Gerald Bayless... And Grant Carter converging to stop Bryant after a short gain. The offensive line has the big book in, set tackles, and Brett McNeil is the left guard. This unit gave up the most sacks in the league this year. They'll have to be much improved today. Milt Stiegel, along with Gerald Wilcox, will try and establish that inside passing game for Reggie Slack in the offense. Second and eight from the Winnipeg 53. The blitz coming. Goodwin can't get him down, and Slack gets the ball away, and they're ruling, intentionally grounding the football. Goodwin came clean on quarterback Slack. That's an excellent play call by Baltimore on second and long is to bring your linebackers. Goodwin came around on a circle around blitz. Inside came up between the guards, and Slack didn't have a chance. He came through untouched. You'll see him in right in the middle of the screen. But Slack is a very strong quarterback, and he was able to ward him off. But the help from Brigantz and Peyton showed up, and they got him for grounding the football. Well, a team with great speed on defense. And that's why Cal Murphy felt they had to go straight at them because if you try to get outside the Baltimore team, they'll just run you down. Well, they have great team pursuit. They only play with two down linemen. Actually, they play with three rush backers in the linebacker position and seven defensive backs. So this is a team created on athleticism. Well, let's see how far 41-year-old Bob Cameron can kick into this breeze with the exciting Chris Wright handling the kick. And Wright is drilled as he crossed the 45-yard line. Flag is down in the Winnipeg backfield. That a 30-yard punt by Cameron into the wind, an eight-yard return, and already it's shades of last year's East Final. Well, you really have to like the intensity that Winnipeg has in this game. Brandon Rogers with his second specialty team tackle of the game here in the first quarter, but he came down and he just drilled Chris Wright. Right now, Winnipeg is playing on an emotional high. Hey. They firmly believe that Baltimore is completely overlooking them in this game, and guys like Katie Williams. 
call against Baltimore and that'll push it back Tim well Winnipeg felt since they had a 7 and 11 record it was almost like gambling so they were going to come in here and roll the dice with everything they had this afternoon versus Baltimore well, Cal Murphy trying to become the first team with a losing record to beat a plus 500 team in the playoffs since 1984 Tracy Ham second pass over the middle and picked off Jason Mallett has it and Mallett is inside the 30-yard line. So Tracy Ham, who threw just 14 interceptions during the year, has thrown one in the first quarter of the South Semi. The rookie out of Carlton with his first interception of the season shaken up after the pick. Well, Jason came into this game kind of banged up. He had a hip pointer coming in this game, but he's playing center field the way you're supposed to play center field. Right in the middle, Tracy overthrows the ball, but on the return, he is hit from behind by Clark. Looked like he might have had the wind knocked out of him, but a big break early for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Mallet did miss three games with a hip pointer and may have taken a helmet from Robert Clark on the hip. Either way, he's up. And at the bomber bench, and Winnipeg with a chance to take the early lead inside the 30. First down for Reggie Slack and company into this wind in the first quarter. Good protection, Slack, and through the hands of Boyko, incomplete. Douglas Kraft, the former Calgary Stampeder in coverage. The defense has a former Winnipeg Blue Bomber, Alfred Payton, who was number two in the league in sacks this year. Gerald Bayless, a star in the league for nine years. Great set of linebackers, O.J. Brigance, Tracy Gravely, the former B.C. Lions. Irv Smith, all Canadian last year. And Chris Johnson, the fifth different safety that Baltimore has had to employ this year because of injuries. Second and ten for the Blue Bombers. Slack short drop throws incomplete, so Winnipeg's offense has started slow against Baltimore this afternoon. When you're in a game, you don't get that many opportunities to score points, especially being in the position on the field to get a major, a touchdown. And that time, Winnipeg actually blew a terrific opportunity that they had to really take a commanding lead here in the first quarter. Now they have to settle for a field goal attempt from Westwood. And this is no gimme from 35 yards out. And we watched earlier today in the warm-ups, both kickers, Westwood and Huerta, were having mixed results at this end of the field. The left footer, Westwood, puts it up, misses wide to the right. And Chris Wright puts down a knee, so just the single and every kick towards that end is going to be an adventure. The open end of the stadium, and you get a swirling wind going across, an accident ball carried along with the wind, and that really cost Winnipeg that field goal attempt. So Jason Mallett's interception sets up a single point for the Bombers, who strike first here. Inside five minutes gone, first quarter. And Tracy Ham and the Stallions back on offense at the 35. They'll go back to the ground, and here's Pringle up the middle, and he powers his way across the 40. Tough man to bring down as they gang tackle him above the 42. Well, you know, the, the most interesting point about Mike Pringle is this one man is not going to bring him down. All his power is in his legs, and a lot of guys try to put one arm around it, and he'll run through that every time. Nick Subis will get a shot on Stan Mikulas up front doing well actually Colin Scribner's in the game but doing a tremendous job at the center position for Baltimore second and a couple and Pringle gets to the 45 and that should be just enough for the first down Mike Pringle has not gone three consecutive games all year without a 100 yard rushing game but he hasn't had one in the last two weeks. Well, he hasn't had one, and actually he set out most of the game last week. They brought in a backup back trying to rest him because he's carried the ball so many times this season, actually carried the ball more this season than what he did last year, so they felt that he might have been wearing down, but actually he's gotten healthy for this game because he's well rested. Pringle with 1,791 yards to lead the CFL in rushing. Cam on first down, dumps it off. There's Pringle across midfield. Katie Williams 
First man to hit him, but Pringle has another Baltimore first down as the Stallions move into Bomber territory. And actually, that is the type of pass that Tracy Ham is more comfortable in throwing just a circle route out of the backfield to his running back because once you get Mike Pringle in the open field, he is a load to bring down by a defensive back. The offensive line doing a good job as we see Subis once again on Scrivener, but this offensive line is an excellent offensive front, and especially Neil Ford at right tackle. Pringle fourth in all-purpose yards this year. Now Ham rolling outside Williams over the middle incomplete. Pass delivered low on Alphen can't haul it in. And it brings up second and 10. Well, when you look at Ham getting outside, he had the run pass option. That time he might have been better off just holding the ball and picking up the yardage on the ground. KD Williams and a fine young linebacker for Winnipeg. That time losing contain on the Baltimore quarterback, but more often than not, KD will make that play. Second and 10 for the Stallions. Ham hasn't had a 200-yard passing game in the last four weeks. Great protection. Now looking deep, Chris Armstrong in behind everybody, and he drags Mallet down to the four. That's Tracy Ham's favorite target, Chris Armstrong, and it's a 46-yard gain. When you look at a deep pass like that, a lot of times people will trip the breakdown in the secondary, but the offensive line gave Tracy Ham a tremendous amount of time. And when your quarterback can sit there four and five seconds, your receiver should always be open. It's very difficult for a secondary to cover an open receiver that long. Chris Wright made him pay. Make that Chris Armstrong, excuse me. First and goal for the Stallions inside the four. Pringle, the lone setback. Four receivers right side. Ham calls his own number. And he'll walk in. Touchdown, Baltimore. Late hit on the play from Kelly Rush, and that drew a crowd. Tracy Ham called his own number, used Pringle as a decoy, and opens the scoring for Baltimore. And Tracy Ham did a fine job. When Tracy was in college, he was a veer quarterback. That time he ran the speed option down the right side, pulled sharp for Donish, ran behind Neil Fort, just walked right into the end zone. We see Kelly Rush, well after he was in the end zone, slammed him to the turf, and his offensive line came to his protection. Surprised we didn't see a flag on the play. The extra point added by Huerta. And so midway through the first quarter, Don Matthews, Baltimore Stallions, have a 7-1 lead. The knock on Tracy Hammond, Baltimore, is that they've been winning ugly of late, but that was a sharp-looking 75-yard drive, the 46-yard pass to Armstrong, and Ham captain himself. I've always been amazed how you can call a win ugly, because that means that you've actually beat the other team, and it's always a plus to have it. And Huerta kicking it off for the first time today. And this is Biggins out of Texas A&M. And he is met and brought down heavily by Jason Bryant. Well, Just a 10-yard kickoff return. return. Right you know, when Jason we look at that Bryant. touchdown last time, you got right here Fort. He's going to come down get a seal block. You got Pringle, who is the second option. But Ham will come around, and there'll be a gaping down, hole right here. Down, he was a very quarterback in college, and this is one of his strong suits. He'll come around. He has the option to pitch, but his great athleticism allows him to cut back into the end zone for the touchdown. Well, his teammate... In Toronto a couple of years back, Reggie Slack now has to answer back. Hands off to Blaze Bryant, short gain up the middle. Bombers trying to establish the run. We're eighth in the league during the regular season in rushing, averaging about 94 yards a game. Well, when you look at Winnipeg and you look what they've done, this offensive line has been the key. And you look at the total weight, I think it should be a question mark behind that 1,016 pounds. There's the total. Well, make that games played. I was looking at total weight. Excuse me. Games played. One, that's a lot of games that, that during the regular season that this group has played together. Matt Goodwin jumped across the line of scrimmage at the snap of the football. And play whistled down. 
but, but back to Blaze Bryant. Excuse me, Chris. Blaze Bryant last year suffered a devastating knee injury here in the second to the last regular season game. He was second in the league and third in the Outside. league in rushing at that time. Baltimore number 39, second down repeated. And ever since that knee injury, Blaze Bryant hadn't been the same. He's been limping all season. He hasn't got to the point where he's felt totally comfortable with that. And his total yards this season were only half of the 1,200-plus yards he gained last year. Goodwin's offside penalty makes it second and two. Johnstone in motion. Slack play action. Over the middle and almost picked off. Matt Goodwin went up in the air, tipped it, and it just fell to the turf out of the outstretched arms of a couple of salient defenders. That goes back to the point we talked about in the opening. The Stallions Third actually employing three, seven three defensive three backs three in their starting three, lineup. The three three linebackers three, are formerly three, rush ins, but Goodwin showing great mobility, getting right in the passing lane, catching the ball at his highest point, not trying to make the interception, just batting it away. He is a terrific athlete, and he showed you his vertical leap there, rookie of the year in the Canadian Football League a season ago. Now Cameron kicking to the rookie highlight real Chris Wright who broke Gizmo Williams return record that's a great punt by Cameron and right back to his 20 but he is explosive and finds the seam one man to beat and now from behind is caught but Chris Wright's done it again 31 times this year he has had plays of over 25 yards and Matt Pierce came back to catch right after a 46-yard return. And big plays is what this team is built upon. This year, this, this team actually had 37 plays of 25-plus yards on, on special team returns, and Chris Wright was the leader, as you said. But it's always instant field position for Baltimore when he gets his hands on the ball. And the offensive numbers for this team has been down, and this is the reason why Chris Wright has given them short fields to work on consistently. I guess they start at the Winnipeg 35 of Pringle. Stopped up by Kenny Walker, the former Stampeder and Denver Bronco. Pickup of three to four yards for Pringle. But Chris Wright had an amazing season, but his best game was against Winnipeg. His best game, the opening game of the season when he had his best game, 284 return yards against the Bombers. All purpose yards make that. But Chris Wright has been a very exciting addition to this Baltimore Stallion football club. Ball marked at the 31. And Baltimore has employed the hurry-up offense through this first quarter to take maximum advantage of the win. Pressure on him. Got underneath Walker initially, but goes down. Dropped for a loss, and Kenny Walker will get credit for the sack. He had a couple for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers after joining the club from Calgary. Well, he's been a big plus. Katie Williams has been the leader on the defense, but Kenny Walker, since coming over, he is strong enough to play against his huge offensive line that Baltimore possesses, but Kenny Walker was an outstanding player in Calgary. He came over in a late-season trade for quarterback Sean Moore, and he's been a welcome addition to sure up this defensive line for the Bombers. Carlos Huerta will attempt this field goal with the wind at his back from the 45. 80% efficient on the year. And Huerta puts that one through to expand the Stallion lead. It's a nine-point lead still first quarter in Baltimore. Well, these Baltimore fans like what they've seen so far. Two big plays have been the key, the 46-yard pass to... Chris Armstrong, and then the Chris Wright return, which has set up the 10 points. This offensive line, though, for Winnipeg, when you look at them shoulder to shoulder, they actually outweigh the Baltimore offensive line. You got the two bookends, Garrell and Walby at tackle, but you look over here on the other side, and you got Neil Ford and Bordonis, last year outstanding offensive lineman in the league, playing tackle for Baltimore. Just two outstanding blocking offensive lines. You notice the question mark on either side? Well... <laughs> it comes down between a T-bone or two, whether the weight is correct or not. Pass incomplete for Blaze Bryant. Well, they list Walby at 3.30, Neil Ford at 3.30, Miles Garrell at 3.30, but you and I both know none of those guys weigh only 3.30. Well, we were actually parked behind the team bus yesterday, and you could actually tell which side the offensive line was sitting on and which side the kickers were sitting on because the, tr the bus was leaning to the right. 
And that's no exaggeration. It was listing badly to the right. <laughs> Actually had one of the back tires off the ground. <laughs> Second and ten for the Blue Bombers, who have not been able to get anything done on offense in this first quarter. Slot quickly over the middle. There's Stiegel. And uh, first down for Milt Stiegel on that hot pattern inside. Ken Watson dragging the slot back down. Stiegel with 469 yards receiving. Now, this is what makes uh, Reggie Slack very successful when he can hit the hot routes. And what that does, it's going to slow down the pass rush of Baltimore, but it's also going to build up his confidence because he cannot go into the second quarter without having moved his team down the field. That's the first first down of the game for the Blue Bombers. Slack has protection and overthrows Tim Daniel. Incomplete. Some doubt about whether Daniel would be in the lineup today because of an injury suffered earlier in the week. They brought to Horn O'Bannon with them on this trip, and Cal Murphy made the decision late yesterday to go with Daniel. Well, when you look at the offensive line, Chris Walby up front doing a decent job on Max, but Max, he comes through late and lays a lick on the quarterback, Slack, and Slack felt that the hit might have been late, and the officials possibly should have thrown a flag, but it was a question mark right there. It was close. Second and ten, under three minutes to go, first quarter. Pressure on Slack. Getting outside of Grant Carter. Pass for Ganston. Ran out of room on the sideline in front of the Winnipeg bench. And he'll be short of the first down. Well, that, that's a good job defensively by Baltimore to cover the receivers downfield. But Reggie came out on first down in this drive and threw a hot route to get the first down. But this time, he wanted to hold the ball too long. Wilcox being double covered down the field could get it loose in his own coverage as he was passed off to Watson. But he's got to get rid of the ball much quicker. Great coverage on Wilcox there by the Baltimore pass defense. And Bob Cameron came in. Got away a great punt into the wind the last time, but may have outkicked the coverage, and Crick's right brought it back 46 yards. Another good punt. And right hammered as he hit the got the ball. It'll be no yards, but that might not be a bad strategy today against Chris Wright. Well, Brendan Rodgers again. I was thinking that myself, Chris, take the penalty. 15 yards is much easier to give than the 46 yards on the return. At least you give your defense an opportunity to come out and stop the offense. Well, we're just nicely underway in the 1995 CFL playoffs, and later today, We'll go to McMahon Stadium, second half of our doubleheader this afternoon. The Hamilton Tiger Cats, Don Southern, going back to McMahon and leading the Tiger Cats, Steve Taylor, against the Calgary Stampeders, 15 and three on the year. And you have to be in awe of Doug Flutie coming back after that elbow surgery this soon and taking the helm once again of the Calgary Stampeders offense. First down for Ham and quickly hitting the line is Pringle up to the 40. Gain of four. Just thinking, Stampeders, 15 wins. Dodd Matthews, Baltimore, 15 wins on the year. But a team with 15 wins or more in the regular season has never won the Grey Cup. They have never won the Grey Cup. Actually, Edmonton even won 16 games one season and never made the, the to, to the Grey Cup. Saskatchewan won that in 1989. But this Baltimore team has vastly improved over last year's team that won 12 games. And not just by the record, but by the personnel. Tracy Hand. Step up and was brought down near the line of scrimmage. Katie Williams there again. And stops him short of the first down. Well, Calgary and Baltimore will try and change this. In 1995, they are the favorites as we start the playoffs. But BC Lions told us all about what favorites uh, advantage was last year in the playoffs. You know, favors come from guys who perform on the field, not what the reporters write about in the newspaper. And you have to perform to get there. You just can't read the articles. Here's Stiegel. And again, downfield, good pursuit. Charles Anthony that time, limiting Stiegel's progress. 107 to go. First quarter, a 41-yard punt by Miller. No return and a nine-point lead. 
Cal Murphy rallying his troops on the sideline, trying to explain to them they got to get the wall set up on the punt return. They're going to come down. It might not look there, but you have to have faith in your blockers and get to what's designated to be the designated block points. Well, a fixture in the playoffs, Cal Murphy, and he had that little smile on his face today as if his team was poised for the upset, but they've got to get going offensively. Here's Boyko with the reception, steps out of bounds at the 39-yard line, forced out of bounds by Tracy Gravely. You got 17 on 17. Boyko probably the best hands on Winnipeg, but this is a very nice ball thrown by Reggie Slack into the winds. A nice tight spiral, an easy ball for Boyko to catch, and he knew where the first down sticks were. Talking to the receivers prior to the game, they felt along the sidelines where the turf might start to give way first. A little bit softer outside than in the middle of the football field. First down for the Bombers. Slack rolling right, Gravely couldn't bring him down, but it's intercepted. Fumble, and Baltimore got back on it. So Reggie Slack throws the interception, and it looks like Gerald Bayless came up with the ball. Covered by the Big mistakes early by Winnipeg here in the first quarter. Two costly turnovers. That time, Slack under tremendous pressure once again by Carter, and he just held the ball too long. He has to recognize when he sees the rush coming from the outside to pull up inside. That time, he threw it to a wide-open Smith, but watch the hit by Johnstone. <laughs> but an alert Gerald Bayless comes and scoops up the ball the second time and keeps Baltimore with prime field position at the 37. Yeah, with the wind at their back, Irv Smith with just his second interception of the year. And Ham goes back to work. Gibbs to Pringle. And there's a big ball up the middle. And Pringle rumbles inside the 25. Gain of 13 for the leading rusher in the Canadian Football League. And we just showed a shot of that offensive line for Baltimore as Joe Bayless is sending out accolades right there, but watch the holes by this offensive line up front is Mike Pringle on a draw play. Mike Withicombe getting out on Moat untouched, allowing Pringle the room to pick up the extra yards, and he's just churning them up. 34 yards here in the first quarter for Pringle. Goes back to work left side. Not much doing that time. Drilled back on the play as Shannon Garrett moved up. Stan Mikawas was holding on. And that's the end of the first quarter. They'll switch ends. Cal Murphy's team will have the wind in the second quarter, but they trail here by nine. The CFL on CBC, brought to you by Ford of Canada. Makers of the new 1996 Ford Taurus. We're back at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. Just ready to start the second quarter. Winnipeg wanted to stick close early. They're down by nine, but they'll have the wind advantage in the second quarter. However, Baltimore still has the football. Home of the 97 Grey Cup, at least for now, but some serious questions being asked about the future of this football club in the wake of news today that's becoming even more clear that the Browns are headed to Baltimore. Gracie Ham, all kinds of time, and he threw it up and almost intercepted by Jason Mallett, who has one pick today. But Ham throwing against the wind for the first time, couldn't find Gerald Alford. And Alvin is one of those players hoping to have a big game this afternoon versus Winnipeg. But once again, the offensive line for Baltimore just giving Tracy Ham all sorts of time to sit in the pocket, not feeling any pressure, gave Alvin an opportunity to go deep on a post corner route. The ball was just thrown behind him, throwing into the strong headwind. Saw, saw those signs and... Uh... Fans aren't sure what to make of the news. Still 60% of fans don't believe the Browns are coming to Baltimore. Huerta now misses from that end of the field. Boyko will concede the single, and that's a moral victory for Winnipeg. And I know Carlos Huerta before the game said the wind was playing with his mind, and he's pondering what went wrong there. 
Well, the wind is actually going from left to right, and, and the problem is, is with a kicker, you really can't compensate it because the ball is tumbling, so the wind is actually pushing it harder than what it will push a pass. And that time, as you said, Werther missed to the right also, just as West Westwood did in the first quarter. Well, both teams turned the ball over in the first half, but as you can see, Reggie Slack and the Bombers didn't get anything done on offense. They didn't, but it really hurt them the first time when they had the ball in the first quarter down in prime field position that they only came up with a single. Reggie Slack needed to be more patient, throw the quick, hot passes, the 70 series. They had a lot of success with that last week versus Ottawa in the, first, in the fourth quarter. They needed to come back to that this afternoon versus Baltimore. Well, the fans here in Baltimore at the stadium today making their pro CFL voices heard. Another short gain is that running game that Winnipeg was trying to develop has not materialized yet. Tracy Gravely with the tackle that time. Well, Blaze Bryant is still a little tentative in his running, but Tracy Gravely for the second successive season has led Baltimore in tackles. He's playing an outside linebacker position as they call it, but he's actually a defensive back. They employ seven defensive backs in their scheme, and he's one of them. Gain of two for Bryant in second and eight. And Slack has a receiver over the middle, and Wilcox was pounded by Charles Anthony, but hangs on, and they will spot it for first down over the 45. And that's a very generous spot, yep. Chris, but the officials understand this. This is the football game, and the big hit possibly drove him back, but Winnipeg desperately needed that first down because they could not afford to punt the ball in this situation. Watch the hit by Charles Anthony, who puts the shoulder in Wilcox, this is a very tenacious, hard-hitting defense. Alfred Payton, the team's leading sacker, versus Chris Johnstone, who is one of the better blocking fullbacks in the CFL with some help from Blaze Bryant. First catch for Wilcox, and now the give up the middle, and again, tough sledding into the heart of that Baltimore defense. Chris Johnstone that time the ball carrier. You would expect as an offense to have more success running straight ahead versus this defense because they are a very light defense, not a lot of weight up front because they really built this defense for lateral movement. But they've done a good job here in the first half versus Winnipeg on the ground up the middle. Yeah, their biggest two men are Demetrius Maxey at 265 pounds, Gerald Bayless at 260. But they are outweighed by that offensive line. Flag down as Rendy Slack airs it up for Blaze Bryant and overthrows the intended receiver by three or four yards. Let's find out what the marker's all about. I think we're going to get an offside. Baltimore came with the blitz, and we had someone jump in that neutral zone, and, and that's a foolish play, a costly play for Baltimore. Offside. Baltimore, number 25, five-yard penalty, second down repeated. And that was the free safety Griffin who was offside, and Coach Matthews is not going to be too pleased with that. They came with the free safety blitz. Slack rest, recognized it and tried to go deep. So it'll make it second and three. Baltimore, number two against the rush this year. Number eight against the pass. And Slack rolling right. And he'll carry it across midfield and has the first down. Grant Carter with the tackle. I think he's going to be a little short, Chris, on that one. Well, again, it's going to depend on the spot. And the Stallion defense indicating uh, your way that they are going to be about a foot short. Well, it's almost like the hockey, the red line in hockey. You, you were close. <laughs> Oh, we'll the, get a measurement. They're going to have to gamble if they are short on this one because they can't give it up. They have to go down. They need to try to get some points here. That The Stallions are a very potent offensive ball club. They average a lot of points. And Winnipeg, over the last six games, have actually been averaging 34 points a game. And Reggie Slack thought he would take it on himself. He's a very powerful runner. But when you get two and three defenders wrapping you up, they stopped him short. That was Grant Carter, who was the lineman of the week last week in the CFL. But I think Reggie's going to have to do that a little bit to keep this Baltimore defense honest. So Cal Murphy's first gamble of the game. They need about a foot. And Slack surging behind Dave Van Conant, who is the 
top offensive lineman on the Blue Bombers this year will have the first down. You know, he, he is routed out into a very nice center here in the CFL. Dave Conant out of Boise State. Chris Walby and Miles Gorell have gotten a lot of publicity for the offensive line for Winnipeg. Right, go, Jay, but Dave Von Conant has been steady year after year, and he's finally getting the recognition he deserves playing center for the Blue Bombers. Even less than a yard, it's tough to get against that Baltimore D. So it's a first down. The Bombers into Baltimore territory. Wind at their backs, and somebody in the back is Fredgy Slack. Alfred Payton, the former Blue Bomber, has his first sack of the day. He had three against Winnipeg in their first meeting and 18 on the year. The swack attack once again, Chris. Four yards on the play. Alfred Bring Payton coming from the left game. defensive end. He, the speed rush to get around Chris Walby. These two know each other very well from their years together as Blue Bomber teammates. But it's hard to keep that guy off of your quarterback. But inside, Brett Maxey had his hands full with Brett McNeil. But the pressure came from the outside. Loss of three at second and 13. Again, markers down. Looked like Baltimore jumped. And Blaze Bryant back across midfield has four to five Blaise yards, but it looked like Tackle Baltimore's offside. Maxie Demetrius Maxey, they called him Brett Maxey last time, but Demetrius Maxey trying to get a jump after being manhandled by McNeil got caught in that neutral zone. The voice inflection of a Reggie Slack. Baltimore number 99, five-yard penalty, second down repeated. Plays a big part in drawing defenders offside, and that time it cost Maxey five yards. Now, Reggie's drawn them offside four times already this afternoon. You know, one of the things I've always been amazed about, how a defensive lineman can jump offside. He's sitting right there looking at the football. Well, you're a defensive lineman. Are you telling me? Uh... No, 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 no. I, I'm not a defensive lineman. I'm a, I'm a color analyst. <laughs> So it's second down and eight. And the Bombers take too long, so they'll march it right back five again. Number 10. And actually, when I was playing, it was my teammate, Gary Lewis, who was jumping offside. They just had the number 78, 79 mixed up. We say thank you to our fans at the City Salute, the Stallions Fan Appreciation Party on Thursday. So Slack looks over to the Winnipeg bench. First playoff game for Reggie Slack, although for ticket information call he said last week was a playoff game as far as he was concerned this is just round number two well I, I think some of the same things are affecting winnipeg as they did last week at home versus ottawa when you look at their sideline the players are very flat they have a lot to play for in this game they need some emotional pickup from the teammates who are not on the field hey, man, as well go. as the guys on the field look at them they're just taking their time coming to the line of scrimmage there's really no bounce in their step this afternoon 7-11 team that's had fragile confidence, but going into this game, they seem to have a bit of a swagger. Here's Slack over the middle, and Wilcox can't bring it in. Chris Johnson does. And Johnson over midfield to the Winnipeg 50 has the second interception of the game for the Baltimore Stallions. Well, the Stallions and their fans thought they got a raw deal in Winnipeg last year, so uh, maybe they're giving us the same kind of welcome. We got the RCMP being hung in effigy here, so some of the Stallion fans not entirely enamored with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. So, so what are you saying, turnabout fair play? <laughs> as far as they're concerned, anyway. Well, you see Wilcox on that slant route over the middle. The ball was just high and off his fingertips, and Johnson was right there to pick off the deflected pass. Mike Pringle tries the left side. Burst down to the 40-yard line. Darius Watson forcing him out of play. But Pringle has another first down. One of the things Baltimore has been able to do is take advantage of the turnovers offensively that the defense has provided for them. But their offensive line, you have to be very impressed with them. Two plays ago on the interception as Brigance was giving Reggie Slack the business, as you would call it, trying to keep him down on the turf after he threw the interception. But... You have to be aggressive defensively to cause those type of turnovers. Yet the pressure from Brigance may have been the key on that play, and now Pringles, and he's met after a couple of yard gain into the arms of Colin Mike Scribner. Mike Pringle, the ball carrier. Colin Scribner, the younger brother, Colin Glenn Scribner of the BC Lions, doing a good job in the middle versus Nick Subas, an all-star center here last year. He fights off the block. He sees the search play 
by Pringle. He reads off, wraps him up, and drops him right in his tracks. Just one on the play, second and nine. Cam throwing the out and overthrows the intended receiver, Robert Clark, the former Toronto Argonaut. And it'll be third down, and Puerto will come on. And I think they might be stretching his range right here, Chris, with Carlos Huerta about 45 yards. But Tracy Ham getting late pressure. He just threw that ball high, and the wind has caused problems for the kickers as well as the quarterbacks. He's going to have to kick this one to the left and compensate for the wind and let it curve in there. Almost like a cue shot. This from 45 yards out. Boyko is the lone man back. Line drive. Well, he played it too far to the left this time. And it didn't come around. So the Bombers are dodging bullets here. And it's now 12-1. Our odyssey through the South Division semifinals continues tomorrow in San Antonio when the Barracudas take on the Texans. A rematch of their game last week, 48-42 for Birmingham. And then it's BC at Edmonton, game two of the North Division semifinal. Big word, Chris, out of San Antonio. Matt Dunnigan will dress and will be the number three quarterback despite the fractured knuckle for Birmingham. Shades of the 91 great cup. Here's a quick hitter into the flat for... Gerald Wilcox, his second catch, and Ken Watson knocked him out of bounds. Well, Wilcox is one of the tools that they need to have involved in their offense. He's the big play guy. He went over 1,000 yards in receiving once again for the third successive season, but came up short of the first down. He has to know where the sticks are. The team has a second and medium. Gerald Wilcox did not play in the first meeting between these two teams. Bombers were one and eight on the road this year. Here's a pass on the far side. Stegall will have the first down up to the 54. On the flip side, Baltimore was 8-1, so that amplifies how tough the task is for the Bombers to win here today. And you talked about Wilcox not playing in the first meeting. Actually, only one player in the skill position on offense did play in that first meeting, and that's the fullback, Chris Johnstone. So they actually have a whole entirely new offensive arsenal versus Baltimore in the second meeting of the season between the two teams. And that illustrates more than anything how much the turnover has been in Winnipeg this year because of injuries and the like. Reggie Slack on a roll in trouble and well, he grounded that football. This time the flag did not fly. They're going to say that his knee was down on the ground on the plate. Well, he may have tripped over big Chris Walby as he tried to find a seam. Well, he just couldn't find an open receiver down the field, and he did Chris over Walby, but trip over Walby, but the knee was down, and that's the reason the flag didn't come out. But when you talk about the, the roster changes, 75 different players have dressed for Winnipeg this season. A lot of frustration for the coaching staff not being able to develop any continuity early. Here's that little toss inside, plays Bryant back over midfield, down to the 51. But he'll be six yards short of the first down. And Bob Cameron will have to come on. Cal Murphy really didn't feel trouble this afternoon coming into this game. He actually felt quite confident, as you'll see Von Conan right in the front on Maxey getting the job done along with Robinson, the offensive guard on the shuttle pass. But he felt that his team had an opportunity, talked about Baltimore possibly being overconfident, and his team really didn't have the pressure. They weren't expected to win. Kevin Robson, the third down snapper. And Bob Cameron will try and pin Baltimore deep. But they have to deal with Chris Wright. Good punt by Cameron and Wright out of his end zone. And he breaks tackles again. Dropped the football. Did Winnipeg get on it? No. Baltimore maintains possession. 52-yard punt. Chris Wright, the 17-yard return. And after the fumble, Baltimore.
Well, the Hawk, Doug Hawking, made the initial contact on Chris Wright, but was slow to get up. Doug Hawking, you'll see him as he comes over the top. He came in real quick. We'll get a freeze as he comes right over the top of Chris Wright. He's going to come from the corner, and he's going to come right here, as you'll see. But he came over, and he actually landed on that shoulder there as he made the hit, and that's why he was still down on the field. Well, the Winnipeg defense will try and keep Baltimore pinned up here. Tracy Ham, the quick hitter to Shannon Culver, and Culver with some room up to the 29. Jarred hard there, and gets up. And has some words with the always boisterous KD Williams. Well, KD Williams is going to talk himself through a game as well as being a great player. He's also the great conversation piece, I guess, when he's on the field. But Shannon Culver, these are what some of the plays that Baltimore likes to run is the quick hitch, allowing those offensive linemen to get out. It's basically like a running play because they get them out very quickly and allow the receivers to cut back in underneath and pick up the downfield block. First down, Baltimore at their own 30. Here's Pringle. And he gets out to the 35. Mike Pringle on the carry. John Moten with John the tackle. Moten. And although there's been quite a turnover in the linebacking department By for Arcade Winnipeg the this year, Paul Randolph, they'd love five. to have, they'd love to have Greg Clark. Cal Murphy felt they had some pretty good run linebackers in, in Moten and Kelvin Smith today. Well, Kelvin Smith and Moten have a lot of size inside. Moten has a lot of CFL experience. He spent many seasons in Hamilton, and they felt that was possibly their best challenge versus Baltimore this afternoon with those two big linebackers inside. Second and five, they swing it to Pringle. And Mike Pringle has the first down, and is game tackled at the 48. That's a pickup of 13 for Pringle, who's done it on the ground and through the year so far this afternoon. Well, that's actually a pass play because if we look where Mike Pringle catches this football at, he's actually behind Tracy Ham when he throws it. If you get a freeze, he's actually two yards behind Tracy Ham. It goes down as a pass, but they need to look at that. That's a run. But once again, those offensive linemen, Fort Whitcomb downfield and Port Donish picking up the blocks, allowing Pringle to pick up the extra yardage. But the mobility of these big guys, you really have to be impressed with them. So Baltimore driving against the wind, and they go back to Culver. Same play, and this time, better defense, and Moten came over to finish him off. Winnipeg defensively did not expect for Tracy Ham to be patient. Tracy's been known as a gambler, a quarterback who likes to go deep consistently, but what he's doing Four now is showing poise. He is nickel down, and diamond. And picking apart the Winnipeg defense, stretching them from sideline to sideline, and he's actually wearing them down. He'll confer with Steve Barato at the Baltimore bench. Got a conversation going on with the officials out at midfield also. Three oh two to go, first half. We got a timeout down here on the field. Minus fifteen, where they're standing by for the first game of the North Division semifinals today. It's Hamilton at Calgary. Unbelievable story. Doug Flutie ready to start that game for the Stampeders. Scott Oak and Ken Austin standing by at halftime for a preview of that game. And then we'll be back here in Baltimore to talk about the first half here. Chris? First meeting of the year between those two teams. Second and five, and here's Pringle. Wrestled down by Kenny Walker. And this will depend on the spot. Pringle was close to the first down and then thrown back by the big defensive end. Well, Kenny Walker is a very strong football player, but Mike Pringle demonstrated how strong he is as a ball carry because he carried Kenny Walker about five yards after contact was made. But, but Tracy Ham is sticking with his bread and butter, the quick pass to the backs and the receivers. Talking about that Calgary game, Alan Pitts is back for the Stampeders today. Great receiver out of Cal State Fullerton. Same school that produced Damon Allen and Mike, Mike Pringle. Pringle. Well, you think about Allen Pitts and Doug Foody being back in that Calgary arsenal of things out there. That's a very potent offense and a very frightening offense when they have all of their weapons on the field at the same time. Well, Don Matthews has to be happy. His team leads by 11, but I think 
This drive has been even more impressive. They're going against the wind. They started back around their 15-yard line. They're chewing up the clock, and they may be able to get it in, into position for another score. Go back to Pringle. Bounces off, and Pringle's in trouble. John Bowden has him back on the other side of midfield. So that time, great pursuit by the Bomber D. Del Lyles closed the hole, and John Moten ran him down. Well, you spoke earlier about the linebackers, but Kelly rushed the right Big defensive John end, collapsed play. down the right side, not allowing Pringle anywhere to run, along yeah. with Miles, but Moten scraping out, inside out, as you expect from your linebackers, bringing him down for a big loss for Winnipeg on the play. Loss of six, second and 16. <laughs> Alpin in motion, left side. That's a 41-yard pickup. That's in that big play category Don Matthews has. And Baltimore's on the move. Peter Tui Pelotu was the starting fullback for Baltimore last season. Robert Drummond has displaced him from a starting role, but they split time. They feel that he is possibly their best set of hands out of the backfield. A circle route deep down the sideline uncovered Tracy Ham had five seconds to throw the ball once again you can't cover receivers that long down in open field stallions knocking at the door Mike Pringle big hole right side and that's another first down inside the five. Pringle on the carry following the top offensive lineman in the south this year Mike Withycombe well, coming with the draw play, what you had that time was K.D. Williams coming from the outside. He's going to come out here, and he's just going to come in. They're going to get a seal block down inside, but K.D. Williams came in out of control. You have to be more in control when you're coming from the outside. Mike Pringle exploited it, took it down to the four-yard line. First and goal from the four. Under 90 seconds left, first half, and play whistle down, and Williams didn't hear the whistle. You always know when a defensive player puts his hands up that he knew he did something wrong. Second down. KD Williams tried to say, I didn't hear it, I didn't hear it, but he actually knew that the play was there, but he couldn't pass up on the opportunity to take the shot at Tracy Ham. Hey, he's playing defense. Bleed this case very well, though. <laughs> so it's a loss of the down. Second and goal. Quick toss. Quick goal. Touchdown. Bye. rushing touchdowns on the season and Mike Pringle finds the end zone here. With three plays in succession, they had KD Williams involved in it. Mike Pringle with the speed pitch once again from Tracy Ham. Williams gambling, forgetting about his responsibility. Baltimore touchdown. And the extra point is not good. Carlos Huerta slipped and the ball hit the bar. And that is the first missed convert this season for Baltimore. Well, Carlos worked it down in that area. If you look where he kicks from, the turf has really been chewed up in that area, and that plant foot just gave way as he tried to stride through on the football. You get a perfect look right here as that plant foot comes in. You got to clean those cleats. He actually overstrides on the ball. He digs it up like a sand wedge coming through. Turf flying everywhere and missed extra point for Baltimore. 
Well, it's been a tough afternoon for Ford. Now, otherwise, it's been a great one for Baltimore. They now lead 18-1, to 1, thanks well, we, to this Mike Pringle TD. You get another look at it. Tracy Ham had no doubt in his mind that he was going to pitch that ball to Mike Pringle in a hurry. K.D. Williams did exactly what they expect. You see him at the top of the screen coming across, and there's no support outside. Mike Pringle just waltzed into the end zone for the second touchdown this afternoon for Baltimore. Well, that's a great drive by the Stallions against the wind. They were four for four on second down conversions on the drive of the big play that passed to Tui Pelotu on second and 16. Bill Stiegel looking for the hole, and down he goes at the 26-yard line. Just under a minute to go now, first half. A 13-yard return by Stiegel. And an 18-1 Winnipeg deficit. Pringle savoring the lead on the sidelines. That was a 92-yard drive. And it was against the clock and against the wind. Actually left Winnipeg with very little time here late in the second quarter. And the offense is really cold sitting on the bench all this time. It's been cold most of the first half. Slack has an open Boyko up to the 36-yard line, close to the first down. And now Winnipeg into a hurry up. They've got to get some points on the board. They've got to get something positive going to take into the dressing room. Well, they blew the first opportunity they had in the first quarter when they didn't convert the turnover into points and they only got the single out of they needed at least a field goal but right here they actually desperate for points Chris they need to go down and at least savor a field goal going in at halftime because going in with only one point that's a moral defeat for them that completion of Wilcox short yardage but it does move the sticks first down 41 seconds to go Reggie has time and not incomplete Boyko can't squeeze it with Douglas Kraft providing coverage. Douglas Kraft actually improved their secondary when he came in. He was a late addition from the Indianapolis coach. He played the past couple of seasons with the Calgary Stampeders. He's a big, strong cornerback, and he'll come up and challenge those receivers. That time he arrived the same time the football did with Boyko. Second and ten. And the Bombers need a big play. Here comes the rush and slack. Just got it away. Closest man to the football was the right guard, Kevin Robson. Grant Carter was bearing in and hit the arm of slack as he delivered the football. You know, when you, I was speaking about Boyko a moment ago, and, and, and last week was a very tough time for the Boyko family, Bruce and Alan Boyko. Bruce plays with Saskatchewan, and the brothers are basically rooting against each other that the other one would not make the playoffs. A very tough time in that family's household. Well, you saw Carter get his arm under the passing arm of Slack, forcing this third down punting situation, and you don't want to give Chris Wright another shot. Instant field position is Chris Wright and a very dangerous return guy. A game here a month ago versus Saskatchewan at this same point. He returned one for a touchdown. Well, that's the smart play by Cameron. Just kick it out of bounds. <laughs> 38 yard punt by Bob Cameron with the key stat. No return. Cal Murphy's been employing motivational speakers all week. Today it was his turn, but right now the Bombers don't seem to have the energy that I think we expected they'd take into this football game. Well, you know, it's very difficult to explain why a team with this much on the line would be so flat, and they've done it two weeks in succession. It took them 45 minutes last week to turn up that emotion button at home versus Ottawa. And this afternoon, on the road versus Baltimore, the best team in the South, it's hard to wait 45 minutes to get that, that spark fired up. Cal's team needed 19 unanswered points last week 
to get into the playoffs. And right now they're down by 17 as Tracy Ham and the Baltimore Stallions wind the clock down in the first half, completely dominated by Baltimore on both sides of the football. Ham had a touchdown. Pringle had a touchdown. And it's an 18-1 lead. Well, a very dominating first half of football by Baltimore, as you talk about. They got points off a of turnover. Ba Winnipeg turned the ball over a couple of times. Baltimore was able to take advantage of that. The defense has played exceptionally well for Baltimore, though. Really hasn't allowed Winnipeg to get anything going offensively in the first half. Now, Cal Murphy will dip into that motivational speaker's bag of his. See if he can re-energize his troops for the second half here at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore where the home side appears poised to extend their 10 game winning streak. The Grey Cup finalists from a year ago in control here after 30 minutes of football. Let's join Mark Lee. Thank you, Chris. Well, the statistics in the first half say it all. 18 to 1 for Baltimore. Look at the total offense, 198 to 71. Head coach Don Matthews agreeing to join us on the sidelines before heading to the locker room. Don, how did you see the first half? Well, it's a win game, you know, and a lot of things are happening. The field's a little bit slippery, so, uh, you know, it's, it's really difficult to play some offensive football. Our defense, I thought, was really playing super, only giving up one point, but it's really affecting the kicking game, especially the field goals. Don, briefly, we wondered off the top whether the news of the Cleveland Browns might affect your team, but that doesn't appear to be the case. No, they have no bearing on us. Uh, the wind is the only thing that's a factor, and the, the fortunate thing is we've got the wind in the fourth quarter because it's our choice, so that wind surely is a factor, as everybody knows in the CFL. Don, thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Don Matthews heading to the locker room, his team in command of this football game with a lead of 18-1 to 1 over the Blue Bombers at the half. We're back right after this. Welcome to Chrysler Canada's Halftime Report. Now, here is your host, Scott Oak. In Baltimore, the Stallions and Bombers are through 30 minutes of their South Division semifinal with the Stallions in front by 17. Baltimore stormed into the playoffs on a 10-game win streak. The Bombers just made it to the postseason, so this game is following the form chart. Toronto Argonaut quarterback Kent Austin is our game day analyst. Kent, at the start of the telecast, we talked about upsets. Baltimore seems bent on not being the victim of one today, but are you surprised their lead isn't wider than 17? 17 points is a good lead, but it could be a lot larger than it is. Baltimore's had great field position, not only on the turnovers, but also the return by Chris Wright. They just really haven't capitalized today. What must Winnipeg do to get into this game in the second half because they had nothing going in the first half? Winnipeg's getting beat up front. They're not controlling the line of scrimmage offensively. Uh, Baltimore's stopping the run. They're getting to the quarterback. And, the, and secondly, Winnipeg's receivers are not getting any separation at all right now from the Baltimore defensive backs. Now later here in Calgary, the 15-3 and three Stampeders host the Hamilton Ticats in a North semifinal. There are worse positions to be in than to be 15-3 and three on the season and playing a playoff game at your stadium. Yeah, I mean, I keep hearing about the pressure for Calgary. I mean, Calgary's been the best team in the league this year. They've got a 15-3 and three record. I'd much rather go into the playoffs under that scenario than, than what you otherwise could be under. The Ticats have Mike O'Shea going for them. Uh, he is their leader, the heart of their defense. Canadian middle linebacker, the Ticats, really went into a tailspin when he missed six games because of an elbow injury. Doug Flutie's elbow is healed, and the four-time Calgary Stampeders CFL MVP is ready, willing, and able to start at quarterback for the Stamps today. And Flutie spoke to Don Whitman a few moments ago. Well, Scott, there are some people who might suggest the 1995 comeback of Doug Flutie is even more improbable than the 1984 Boston College Hail Mary pass. How do you react? I guess it's right up there. I really didn't expect it. I was hoping in the back of my mind, keep my fingers crossed and just work your tail off and, and hope the arm would come around and it's come around just in time. Any concerns that you might re-injure it? I don't think so. I mean, I, this week I threw the ball hard uh, three days uh, out of the week in practice and had no repercussions. Uh, rested a little bit yesterday and it feels very strong today. The usual velocity? I think so. I feel like it. Um, I'm throwing wide side outs, throwing seam routes, throwing post routes. So. Uh, yeah, the, it feels about as strong as it did probably third, fourth week of this season. Good luck, Doug. Now let's go over to Dan Kepley. Thanks, Don. I'm here with middle linebacker Mike O'Shea of the Hamilton Tidecats. Mike, big game today. You're playing against one of the best in the business. Defensively, that's got to put a lot of pressure on you. What do you have to do to stop Calgary today? Well, the main thing is uh, execution. You know, we can't afford to make any mistakes. Uh, anytime you make a mistake around Doug Flutie and uh, Sponges and Pitts, they're going to capitalize on it. 
So uh, we run a clean slate, and I think we'll uh, come out on top. Mike, uh, taking a look at the defense and the lineups that you have right now, you're the middle linebacker. You've got Hassan Bailey on the outside. You've got Hitchcock on the other side. Two basically halfbacks coming up there. Do you expect them to try to rush the ball against you a lot? I think they'll try, but uh, we got a lot of speed there with those two guys, and I think we can come up on top. Mike, good luck in the game today. Thanks a lot. Good Back to you, Scott. Okay, Cap, and coming up in Calgary, then it's the Stamps and Cats. And in a moment, our Chrysler Canada halftime report will continue from Baltimore, where the Stallions lead the Bombers. Welcome back to Memorial Stadium and the Chrysler Canada halftime report. You can see it's all Baltimore, 18 to 1 at the half. Joining me here in the booth, Chris Cuthbert, James Curry. The wind has been a problem. We heard Don Matthews address that just before halftime. What for a few windblown missed field goals, this game could be out of reach for Winnipeg. Absolutely. Uh, you consider the missed opportunities. They've missed a couple of field goals. Uh, the drive stalled when it looked like they were going in for more, and then the convert even missed. Uh, but uh, clearly on the other side of the ball, James, Winnipeg's got to get moving. they got to be very fortunate what what has happened here in the first half, Baltimore, with the missed opportunities, but they really haven't done anything offensively to move the ball. The quick pass is what they need to go back to. They had some success with it early, but Baltimore took advantage when they had the ball in great field position. Early in the game, Tracy Ham took the ball on a but Gerald Bayless came up with the fumble recovery and then in the second quarter a great drive against the wind capped by this play Michael Mike Pringle once again with the speed off Take a look at the numbers in the first half. Uh, the Bombers with only 71 yards total offense. What have they got to do to get back into this game? They need to come back with some quick passes. Try to run the ball inside more successfully. All right, 18 to 1. The Bombers trail the Stallions here at Memorial Stadium. We're back with the second half kickoff right after this. Of course, these playoffs headed to Regina in two weeks' time. In two weeks from today, we'll have Grey Cup Saturday. Coverage of the Grey Cup Parade in Regina. And a Grey Cup preview as we set the scene for the 1995 Grey Cup Championship on Sunday, November 19th. It all begins 4 o'clock Eastern time with the Sport Check countdown to kickoff. And what a weekend it's going to be in Regina, Saskatchewan. The pride of the green out on the prairies. Regina, not a more faithful CFL town in Canada. Stallions went there a year ago to the Great Cup final and trying to move on to the second round of the 95 playoffs with a nice lead to start the second half. Winnipeg with the football and the wind in this third quarter as we assess the numbers through 30 minutes of play. Well, you really have to look right here where the ball has just been handled by the Baltimore Stallions. They've kept the ball away from Winnipeg. Time of possession is very misleading because late in the second quarter when Baltimore marched on that 92-yard drive for that second major of the first half really kept Winnipeg off the field. Let's see if Reggie Slack can turn it around second half. From the 36, they fake to Bryant and throw complete Chris Johnstone coming out of the backfield. And he stopped up at the 45. That's a gain of eight. Chris Johnstone can be a very valuable weapon for your offense. I thought that he might get the ball more in the first half because the quick hitters would have kept Baltimore's defense more honest. I know yesterday Cal, Dif uh, Cal Murphy said that Chris Johnstone could be a difference. And Reggie Slack hopes the third quarter will provide a difference. After the two interceptions and just 71 yards passing first half. Second and short out of the backfield. Almost picked off and Charles Anthony had six written all over that one. That's one of the reasons why he's playing defensive back. He doesn't have any hands, but 
Charles Anthony actually should have had that one. That's a blown opportunity for Baltimore. He read the quarterback perfectly. perfectly. Reggie Slack telegraphs his pass right here. Anthony will jump the route, and the ball hits him right in the gut, lays it on the ground. Oh, boy. Charles Anthony, five interceptions during the regular season. And but he'll had, think about that one. Because he had six knockdowns, so that's his seventh yeah. right there. Third down and Cameron in to punt to Chris Wright. Gets that one up into the air and it bounces away from Wright and that will go out at the 16. So Bob Cameron doing the job, 47 yards on that punt and the second straight time he has kicked without a return for Chris Wright. Well, immediately following this game, we'll head out to McMahon Stadium in Chile, Calgary. The Stampeders and the Hamilton Tigers in a North Division semifinal. And the first meeting of the year between these two teams. That's kind of a, an unusual circumstance. A, a real oddity in the CFL. The Canadian teams don't play each other during the regular season. But back to Bob Cameron. 47 yards net on that punt, not allowing Wright any opportunity to return, pinning Baltimore down. Tracy Ham under pressure gets it away, and that's a completion to Chris Armstrong, who shakes the tackle and is helped out of bounds at the 40-yard line. So Ham under the gun, but finds, again, his favorite receiver, number 81, Armstrong. Well, Tracy Ham set that up. As you see his statistics from the first half, Six of ten, Tracy Ham did an excellent job of spreading the football around, but that last pass completion to Armstrong was set up late in the second quarter by spreading the ball around, the quick passes to his, his slot backs and running backs. That time he was able to go vertical to go downfield. Don Matthews said yesterday, forget about the booze he's had this year. This guy is unselfish, and he's not worried about personal stats. Why would he with guys like Mike Pringle to carry the mail? But the heat's been on Ham this year in Baltimore for not racking up more yards through the air. But Mike Pringle is the fixture here, and that's what Don Matthews has accentuated in his offensive scheme. Well, I think, you know, one of the things about Tracy Ham is that every time he touches the ball, he produces yardage. When you look at his average completion and run plays combined, when he completes a pass and when he runs the ball, the average has been 12.5 yards every time he's done that. And that's only down a yard and a half from last year when it was at 13.9. But the productivity of this offense winning 15 games and when you have a consummate team player such as Tracy Ham, it speaks for itself. Inches short after the measurement. So it'll be second down. And this is one of those downs you have to love when you're a quarterback. This is a waste down. You have this huge offensive line that will guarantee you a first down on the ground, but this is where you want to crank it up and go deep. Has three receivers right. Shannon Culver alone on the left side. And Tracy's just going to push it across for the first down. Winnipeg has to find a way to bow up its back now. This has come to a point, even though it's early in the third quarter, that they have to stop Baltimore. They cannot not allow Baltimore to march down and get another major at this point. Cal Murphy needs the ball back. ASAP. With the win to the advantage of Winnipeg in this third quarter. And you heard Don Matthews at the half talking about the wind being a factor. So Pringle cuts through it wide open. Mike Pringle, foot race, and dragging him down, Jason Mallett. But again, big play time for Mike Pringle, over 100 yards on the game. Ninth time this year he's got over 100. And, and this team is 15 and one when he rushes for over 100 yards. A quick hitter right off the left side of the offensive formation. Pringle comes through with the great kick out block there as you saw. And Pringle just explodes through the line of scrimmage, gaping hole, galloping up yardage. Yeah, wind wasn't a factor there. 44 yards for Pringle. 139 on the game. 17 carries. 
make it 18 as Pringle is stopped up behind the line of scrimmage. That time, KD Williams, who set a CFL record for tackles for losses in a game against Toronto a few weeks ago. Six times he got pinball Clements behind the line of scrimmage. Well, here's our CFL trivia question, courtesy Mr. Curry. Mike Pringle with 3,763 yards over two seasons. That is a new two-season record. Who held the record previous to that? Let's, let's think about that for a while. Pringle again, Colin Scribner wrestling him down. And it'll be third down, and Carlos Huerta will come on. Even though Baltimore had driven the ball down the field with the big run by Pringle, Winnipeg's defense. Winnipeg, 72, five-yard penalty. Scribner made the tackle, and he was also offside. That gave him an advantage, I think, once he got a jump on the offensive lineman. But I was going to say that Winnipeg defense had stopped Baltimore's offense, but now they've given them new life with another opportunity with the penalty on the play. But that would might have been the big break that they needed. Well, they've been victimized by the big play. A long pass to Chris Armstrong set up the first touchdown. A long pass to Tui Pelotu set up another score. A long run by Pringle, and now Ham into the end zone. And flags fly as Robert Drummond was leveled before the ball got there. Kelvin Smith made contact in the end zone on Robert Drummond, who came out of the backfield. And right now, the foolish mistakes are piling up on the Winni Winnipeg side of the football. Smith just ran right through Drummond. He never saw sight of the football. He just ran off and ran right through the Baltimore. You'll see it at the Delivery bottom of the screen. Pass interference in goal. Winnipeg, 37. Baltimore, first down on the one. And the ball was actually uncatchable by Drummond. And Matthews is elated that the penalty was called. But as Smith had a found sight of the football, he wouldn't have had to run through Drummond, and when Baltimore wouldn't have the ball on the one-yard line at this point. First and goal from the one. And Ham gives it to Pringle under Smith. Touchdown. Second major of the game for Mike Pringle who had a 41-yard sprint earlier in the drive. Mike Pringle had 13 rushing touchdowns on the regular season and picks up his second this afternoon in this first-round playoff game. But Baltimore's offensive line with a tremendous surge up front and a gaping hole off the right side behind Neil Fort, the 350-plus pound right offensive tackle, and Mike Pence Pringle just waltzed into the end zone after that. Huerta keeps his feet and puts it through. The extra point is good. And it's now 25 to 1. The Baltimore Stallions stampeding the Bombers. Stallions had a 92-yard drive in the second quarter. This is a 93-yarder capped by Mike Pringle. And the reason for that is that offensive line. You look at Dixon and you look at Ford on the right side where Pringle had the luxury of running behind. They just open up a clear path into the end zone once again for him. Right to the right of your screen as he runs right through this hole, Mike Pringle basically goes in untouched for the touchdown. Ball blowing off the tee, so they'll realign. He's got a pigeon playing in the game also. Just landed at the 46-yard line. It's going to have to move, or we can have a probably a death warrant on somebody in a bit. Yep. It won't be pheasant under glass. It <laughs> might be pheasant on the grass here in a minute. No, it's gone. And Stiegel. Pretty good return over the 45. Courtney Griffin, the tackle. Let's join Mark. Thanks, Chris. On the sidelines here with Stallions owner Jim Sparrows. Jim, huge no news uh, here today about the Cleveland Browns possibly moving here for next season. What can you tell us about this story? Well, first of all, um, it's not a final deal. I personally would be surprised if the Browns were to leave Cleveland and move to Baltimore. You know, the reason I came to Baltimore was to establish a franchise, be successful, which we have been, and to have a Baltimore team. With the Cleveland, you know, Baltimore Browns, 
It's just Cleveland's team playing in Baltimore. But if it was to happen, I'd have to relocate. Is it fair to say you might be the victims of your own success? Well, in some ways, yes. But you know something? It's just bad timing because we have one of the best teams in this league, and these players and coaches deserve a lot of credit. And now, these next three weeks with the playoffs, these guys should be getting an attention. Instead, the NFL is flirting again with Baltimore. It just causes us a lot of pain because there's been a lot of work done here in Baltimore over the past two years, and this has been good for the league, and I'm just sorry to see all this happening. All right, Jim, thanks for your time. Okay. Chris? Uh, Jim Spiros reflecting the healthy dose of skepticism that has been around Baltimore for the past 48 hours, but in the last few hours this morning, the report's starting to firm up, and it looks like a done deal. And Stiegel over the middle across midfield has a first down for the Bombers. Well, I tell you, one deal that needs to be done is that the Winnipeg Blue Bombers needs to go down and put some points on the scoreboard. They're getting further and further behind. They're trailing by 24 points here in the third quarter, facing this powerful Baltimore Stallion defense. And Reggie Slack that time was crisp with the hot route. And he has to throw more of those. Get rid of the ball within three steps and let the receivers run with the football. Geez, I don't want to get into these no-yes questions again. I just did that well. Uh, Quebec. <laughs> First down. Here's Stiegel again. Got a block. And this is the biggest Winnipeg gain of the day. Mel Stiegel steps out of the 25. The fans, friend of are, yours. <laughs> fans are a little unhappy because they felt there was a clip on the play. Miles Garrell is, is a big culprit that they think actually threw the clip on Brigance down the field, but a three-step drop by Slack. Get rid of the ball in a hurry. Throw the, the slip screen to Stiegel as he comes underneath, and the offensive lineman getting downfield. You see right there Robson throwing the block, but Stiegel with some fine running in the open field, picking up the big yardage for Winnipeg on the play. 28 yards the gain from Slack to Stiegel. And that would classify as a big play under Baltimore's. Right, anything over 25 yards gets special consideration from Don Matthews. This is the deepest penetration by the Winnipeg offense. Slack looking in zone, boy, Cole can't hang on. Stretched it out. but couldn't squeeze the football. Allen Boyko, the best set of hands on the Bombers team, but as you said, right off of his fingertips, Slack had the time from his offensive line through a beautiful football, but just let his receiver too much. He was open behind the coverage. He had the layout horizontally. He just couldn't pull it to his body. When he made contact on the ground, the ball came loose. Second and 10 from the 25 of Baltimore. Little toss inside, plays Bryant against the green. And Bryant has a first down, but there is a penalty marker, and this coming back, a holding call is going against Winnipeg. Brett McNeil basically with a mugging right there in the middle of the offensive line. It looked like Bryant might have been tackled, but McNeil holding Winnipeg number 57. 10 yard penalty, second down the McNeil wrapped up one of the defensive tackles. It couldn't tell between Maxi and Bayless, the numbers 98 99, but it cost his team a great play. We'll get a shot of it on a replay. Second down and 20. McNeil right here to the right of your screen. Make that brigance that he has as he pulls him to the turf. So it's second and 20. This time they fake inside to Bryant. Slack on a roll. Chris Johnstone pulling his way back to the original line of scrimmage. But it'll be third and 10. Irvin Smith finished him off. O.J. Brigance was in the neighborhood. And on comes the field goal unit for but Winnipeg. I think the real miss opportunity was the Boyko miss reception in the end zone. You'll, you'll look at the penalty and people will say that took him out of field, out of a great field position on the run by Bryant. But when you have a receiver open in the end zone, you have to make that connection. 32 yard attempt and Westwood puts it through. Small consolation though for Winnipeg. It's now a 21-point bomber lead. 
Well, the Bomber fans at Memorial Stadium finally have a little something to cheer about after the field goal by Troy Westwood. What a great weekend of sports on CBC. Doubleheader action this afternoon and as well tonight. Boston, Montreal, Toronto, and Edmonton, the first games, and then the nightcap, Vancouver and Calgary. Doubleheader action tonight, and then doubleheader action again tomorrow. Back on the gridiron. We'll be in San Antonio. Hopefully it'll be a little warmer inside the dome. <laughs> hey, this is football weather. Hey, I froze the last two weeks. I don't enjoy the cold. Here's Robert Drummond taking the swing pass. Trying to turn the corner. But cut off by Kenny Walker in the pursuing and Winnipeg defense. But I must Game say I admire your fortitude. You're standing up here without an overcoat on or anything. The trivia question once again. Well, you had me thinking my first instinct was a guy like Willie Burton, but it goes back a lot further than that. Hey, the year I was born, Johnny Bright, 1957, 3,401 yards. Remember the Edmonton Eskimos. And what a fine running back he was, as you tell me. I was born that year, too. Oh, so. okay. <laughs> Must have been Whitman. <laughs> <laughs> tell you what, that really goes to show you what an amazing two seasons Pringle has had for the Baltimore Stallions. Second down, hand going deep, and Drummond's open. Oh, he matched up Drummond on linebacker KD Williams. He was wide open. Well, once again, the big plays that Don Matthews has talked about, and when you get Robin Drummond, who runs a 4-4, 40-yard dash, locked up on a linebacker, KD Williams, you can see it's a mismatch. If not for the ball being underthrown by Ham, he would have taken that one to the house, but a great concentration on the football by Drummond not to lose it because he mishandled it initially, but he brought it in for the big reception. Former sprinter out of Syracuse at every drive, it appears, James. Baltimore is getting that one big play. That was 38 yards. Now back to Pringle, and he hits the hole hard. Flag down as Mike Pringle chews up more yardage to the 21. The last two drives for Baltimore against the wind. 17 plays, 185 yards, and the two touchdowns, and here they are driving against the wind Holding again. Baltimore number 51, it's first down repeated. And that's what happens when you have the league's leading ground game is that you can churn up yardage. You have a defense thinking that you're going to run the ball on a regular basis, and Tracy Ham has been able to get the ball down the field vertically, but you'll see the holding right here in the middle of your screen. Nick Subas knacking, uh, grabbing Stan Mick was right in the middle of the things, and Stan needed to have a very solid game in the middle to help slow down Mike Pringle this afternoon. So they back Baltimore up 10. And Ham brought down. Kenny Walker stuck out the left arm and showed you his strength as Ham hit the turf. His second sack of the afternoon. And this is an outstanding young man, Kenny Walker. He's been deaf since he's been two years of age. He had a fever that knocked out his hearing and his speech. But Kenny Walker is a fine, dedicated athlete. And Cal Murphy even said, with the addition of Kenny Walker on defense, it's actually helped the rest of his defensive players concentrate doing meetings, be more, being more attentive, and he's been an inspiration since coming over. Now it's second and 25 after the sack and the holding call. Him in trouble again, and down he goes, and Kenny Walker has the hat trick. Wait, this is not a hockey game. <laughs> <laughs> Number three on the game. He had two in a game against the Argos earlier this year. Well, they need a hat trick of touchdowns, James, to get back in it. They actually do, Chris. But Kenny Walker, I mean, he's working all the way through. Neil Fort, the right off of the tackle, 350-plus pounds. Kenny Walker fights through him and picks up his third sack of the afternoon, just constantly working. And that's what the rest of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers need to do is work with that type of effort. Here's Biggins. And again, that great punt coverage. Grant Carter. Grant Carter down quickly. 45-yard punt and minus one on the return. There's the story here in Baltimore. And barring a huge comeback by the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, we will have our second consecutive year of a U.S.-based team in the Great Cup. Winnipeg the lone hope for the 
All-Canadian Grey Cup matchup. Last possession with Winnipeg. Allen Boyko wasn't able to come up with this reception in the end zone, which I still think, believe, I believe this is the largest play for Winnipeg in the game, the one they didn't make. Quick hitter to Bryant. Out of the backfield. And that's across the 20-yard line. Gain of six, seven yards. Alfred Payton, Ken Watson with the tackle. But once again, Reggie Slack throwing the quick passes. That's where he had success in the last drive. And if he can continue to do that, he does not allow the pass rush of Baltimore to rattle him. Well, the rushing game they wanted to establish pretty well abandoned now. And Slack throwing a completion. Wilcox steps out of bounds. Ken Watson was in coverage, but Slack hooks up with his favorite receiver on the year, Gerald Wilcox. Once again, Slack throwing in, in rhythm as you get Wilcox on the out route. Ken Watson, they felt Baltimore that that was the matchup that they wanted to work against Slack this afternoon. Wilcox said that he had a lot of success in the past versus Watson. That time he won that battle. The Bombers had 11 yards rushing in their first meeting against Baltimore this year. And they're only on 11 carries. They average one yard a carry, Chris. And today, 17 yards rushing. That's why they've gone to the air. And here's Blaze Bryant crashing across the 50-yard line. Another first down. Now, that was a very well-designed play by Reggie Slack. Roll right, throw back left, able to get his offensive lineman out in front on that screen. And not enough screen passes are thrown these days in the CFL, but Blaze Bryant did an excellent job. He actually faked like he slipped down on the play, got back up, gave his quarterback a nice target to find in open field, and picked up a first down. Well, the Stallions have made a habit of squandering big leads during their 10-game winning streak. Here's Slack with an open Tim Daniel into Baltimore territory, and Daniel makes a couple of moves to get extra yards and two flags on the play as Daniel confers with Mark Lee on the sideline. <laughs> Mark Lee was getting out of the way. He looked like a former defensive back instead of a quarterback. He had that back pedal working pretty good on the play right there. <laughs> I hope the flag's not against Mark. <laughs> Major foul, face mask, Baltimore number 33, 15-yard penalty, first down Major. Winnipeg. Well, once he said major foul, we knew the penalty wasn't against Mark. <laughs> but a big break for Winnipeg on the play. You'll see right here is Bayless, and make that Maxi throws the punch at Robson right there, and that's the major foul on the play, and it's a little battle going on down in the pits right now but that's football you got defensive linemen and offensive linemen with the hands in the dirt getting up throwing some in each other's face final minute third quarter final minute with the wind and winnipeg starting to move here's a pass for wilcox overthrown wilcox looked over the right shoulder then the left with the ball uncatchable as a receiver you have to run your route out that time wilcox broke it off and started looking back at the quarterback early slack knew that he had the, the distance behind watson and threw the ball out there but wilcox just didn't run through it gerald with three straight 100 yard games to end the year and push his total over a thousand on the season four catches today for 33. Well, in his last five games, he really came on. He had 37 receptions for three for 535 yards and four touchdowns. Big second down conversion here and an incomplete pass. There was contact between Wilcox and Watson over the middle, but no flag. <laughs> I, I think that goes down in the mugging category. Yeah. The contact was to speak lightly of what happened. That time Wilcox was actually drugged to the ground and there was no flag thrown on the play. But once again, a squandered offensive Would opportunity by Winnipeg where they're going to be forced to settle for another field goal attempt. No appeal this time by Wilcox. He argued a non-call earlier. Well, he knows he's not going to win. You know what? They're down by 21. You wonder maybe is this time for a Winnipeg beat. Cameron does set it down, and Westwood puts it through. So they'll chip away one second left in the third quarter, and it's now 25 to 7.
Well, I think you might have looked at a fake opportunity if you'd have been playing someone other than Baltimore. This is probably the best special team team in the CFL. Daryl Adrelson, their special team coach, does an excellent job of preparation every week for the opponents, and this team is well disciplined. Of Cal Murphy's team uh, has at least put some points on the board in the third quarter. They've got a long way to go. But chipping away at Baltimore when your offense hasn't been that potent, you need to get the major. They need to put a touchdown on the scoreboard if they hope to have any opportunity going here in the fourth quarter. Baltimore takes the ball at their own 35, and Pringle off the right side, another big hole. How about Mike Pringle? Into Winnipeg territory to the Bomber 50. Mike Pringle And that's a gain of 25. Well, you can really tell how that rest last week has helped Mike Pringle because he is just churning up the yards going into the fourth quarter. The road to the Grey Cup continues tomorrow with the division semifinals. The action heats up at 1 Eastern with the South Division matchup, Birmingham at San Antonio, followed by a clash of North Division rivals BC and Edmonton. Catch the excitement exclusively on CBC. Pre-game warm-up underway in Chile, Calgary as they get set for the North semifinal later today. There's Doug Flutie who will start at quarterback for the Calgary Stampeders. Don Whitman, Danny Kepley, Scott Oak, Ken Austin and the CFL on CBC crew poised at McMahon Stadium and we'll be going there immediately following this game. We start the fourth quarter with the Bombers jumping offside. Were they drawn? Del Lyles, one of a couple of bombers to move. Kelly Rush inside that restraining area as well. They might have been drawn, but it's still going to cost them five yards. Offside, Winnipeg, number 56 and 90. Five-yard penalty. First down repeated. You have to be patient when you're in a position like this in your Winnipeg. You cannot afford the foolish penalties. The voice inflection of Tracy Ham drawing people into the neutral zone. Dale Lyles, Kelly Rush costing Winnipeg five yards. Mike Pringle has 162 yards rushing on the day. They fake to Pringle and Ham throws. Complete, there's Alvin. And the former Bomber has a catch down to the 36. Darius Watson, the tackler for Winnipeg. Well, right now, this Baltimore offense is in dangerous territory for the Winnipeg defense. If they put points on the board right here, they could basically sew this one up, but the yards rushing 173 by the Baltimore Stallions, that has been the difference. We look at the time of possession, very misleading because Winnipeg hasn't been able to do anything with the ball offensively. First down Stallions, and Pringles off and running again. John Moten hauled him down at the 30. That's close to seven more for Pringle. And Winnipeg's offside once again. But Mike Pringle is such a powerful runner. When he, and he hits the hole so quickly. And one tackler never brings him down. He's smiling right there. Running backs like to carry the ball 20 to 30 times during the game. He's up at 21 rushes right now. They always feel that they get stronger the more carries that they have. And Mike Pringle is a perfect offside. example of that. Winnipeg number 56. Five-yard pass. Well, they'll take the seven yards off Pringle's total and take the five-yard penalty against Del Lyles for offside. Mike Pringle outrushed seven of the teams in the CFL this year, the entire team rushing total of seven clubs. And he had eight 100-yard rushing games during the season, tying his total of last year, where he also accumulated eight 100-yard rushing games. This time stopped behind the line of scrimmage Kenny Walker there so a tackle for a loss for Walker who already has three sacks the hat trick as you call it <laughs> Kenny Walker's had an exceptional game this afternoon as he comes off the corner tight as you expect for your defensive line to do when you get the down block from the offensive tackle the defensive end should scrape right off of his hip and that's what Kenny Walker did very disciplined and made the tackle for loss in the backfield you know, you mentioned Pringle with eight 100-yard games, but he also had a 97-yard game, a 98-yard game, and a 99-yarder. Here's a pass thrown to Armstrong, and 
Chris Armstrong going to try and get outside. Has the first down. Runs out of room as he went horizontal. Jason Mallett forced him out, and Chris Johnstone with a very concerned look as the Baltimore Stallions are holding on to the ball and chewing up the clock. I think this run exemplifies what Baltimore has done all afternoon to Winnipeg's defense is the elusiveness of the offensive players to be able to stretch Winnipeg from sideline to sideline. But the big point is, is that no one from Winnipeg is able to lay a clean hit on any of the Baltimore offensive players. Tracy Ham on the limp after that last play. Seems to be favoring that right ankle. Bakes to Pringle. And now shoots it out incomplete. It's like he hurried that one over the middle to Alpen. Incomplete Chorus Irvin in coverage. Looked almost like a shot put throw. Brett McNeil on the Winnipeg sideline, the big offensive lineman having some concern about the defensive unit not being able to hold off this Baltimore potent offensive tack but Tracy Ham has had a fine job this afternoon done a fine job this afternoon of mixing the run and the pass and keeping Winnipeg off balance defensively they've been great at converting second downs all day over the middle and this one falls incomplete looking for Robert Clark and Clark back in the lineup this afternoon missing the past two games and might have been a little rusty, but that pass was thrown low. But right now, the emotion starting to spill over. KD Williams, who's been the emotional leader of this Winnipeg defense the past couple of games, had 13 tackles two weeks ago, 13 solo tackles in the game, which is an outstanding game. But Mike Pringle and Tui Pelotu giving it to Williams on the play. Hey, that's a sandwich. <laughs> Lots of time. You like Mike Pringle, leading rusher in the league, and even though he's 5'9", 195, he'll stand in there and help Tracy Ham in the blocking department. Here's Huerta, and he has this one through. He gets one of the field goals back, and it's now 28-7. Stallion in control. Home fans happy at Memorial Stadium here in Baltimore. What a historic sports building. The house that Johnny Unitas built. This is where Cal Ripken's Iron Man streak began back in May of 1982. And speaking of Cal's, this guy's got quite a streak going in playoff competition. Ask Cal today, when was the last time you missed the playoffs? And he thought about it for a bit and said, 1976, when I was with the BC Lions. He was a head coach of the BC Lions that year also. He's been a fixture in the postseason for a lot of years. Doesn't like the looks of this one. Here's Boyko with the completion. Well, James, we have Reggie to say, Black though, that the Bombers offense has been able to move the football a little bit in the second half. But when they've moved the ball is that they've moved it with the quick pass. They haven't held the ball. Reggie Slack hasn't held the ball for an extreme amount of time. He has to throw the ball in the three to five step drops. That's when he's been most effective this afternoon. But when he's tried to roll wide, he's had a lot of problems. There's a lot of speed on that Baltimore defense from sideline to sideline. Kelly Rush on the sideline feeling the pressures of the Baltimore offense. Reggie Slack now over 200 yards passing in the game. Good protection. There's Wilcox. And Wilcox bounces off the safety, Chris Johnson. And Gerald gets 10 more inside the 20. O.J. Brigantz had to come back from his middle linebacking position to save the touchdown. But the concentration of Gerald Wilcox on his deep crossing route and the hit by Johnson as he comes up. But he has enough balance to, to maintain his feet and turn around and pick up the extra yardage. But the hustle by O.J. Brigantz playing 90 straight CFL games at rush in and middle linebacker hustling back to make the touchdown saving tackle. 22 for Boyko, then 35 to Wilcox. Bombers on the move. Looking for Daniel, cutting inside, and he has it at the nine. Irvin Smith, the corner, bringing Daniel down, close to the first down. It'll be second and about a yard. You would 
spoke about earlier about Baltimore giving up a lot of yardage and a lot of points in the fourth quarter in their last three ball games. This once again is the same situation that's being presented to their defense now. If Winnipeg can punch it in, we have a ball game on our hands. Second and short, but Slack looking for the end zone touchdown, Gerald Wilcox. So the Bombers have their first major score of the afternoon. And, and I like what Reggie Slack did on that drive is that he threw the ball on time. He didn't sit back and hold the ball, allowing the rush to get around him. But the quick slant by Wilcox, recognizing that he had Anthony on the wheel route, got him picked. Wilcox took it down inside, uh, slack threw the ball nice and low where only Wilcox could make the catch. Gerald had five touchdowns in the regular season, has Winnipeg's first of the 95 postseason, and it's 28-14 with 9.52 to go. Another look as Slack hooks up with his favorite receiver, and the Bombers get a little closer. Gerald Wilcox well, has the Bombers a little closer. Reggie Slack, Reggie Slack went four for four on the drive, and it was capped with that nine-yard touchdown pass. So well, Reggie Slack did a fine job of moving his team down the field, and the thing about it, he was very efficient. He used very little of the clock on that drive, so he left his team with some time to operate if they get the ball back. Chris Wright with a short return, and a reminder, coming up immediately following our game, we'll head to McMahon Stadium, where Don Whitman, Dan Kepley, Ken Austin, Scott Oak standing by. Tiger Cat, Stan Peters, their first meeting of the year. In the North Division semifinal, the other 15 and three team going to work later today. Watch how this ball tails off at the end. And that's from the win. It's actually driving it down. But Wilcox, the veteran receiver that he is, had enough presence to follow the flight of the ball and go down and make the reception. Now the Bomber defense will try and dig in. Pringle broke a tackle. And Pringle powers his way to the 48. KD Williams had the initial hit on Pringle, who's been smiling most of the afternoon. Well, KD Williams is going to bring the hat right here as he meets Mike Pringle. But you really have to like Mike Pringle when he's running with the football. He will make an offensive lineman's job very easy for him. And it also put a smile on the big guy's face because you know if you get the block, He'll pick up the yardage. Second and two. That's Pringle territory. And he drives over the 50. And that should be enough to move the sticks. Kenny Walker there that time. And Kelly Rush looks like he's been shaken up on the play. Kenny Walker's played himself one heck of a football game this afternoon. This young man who came over in a trade from Calgary late in the season, able to collapse it down from his defensive end position and clog up that hole to possibly stop Mike Pringle short of a first down. Kelly Rush, the defensive lineman who is down on the play for Winnipeg, has had a very troubled season this year. Kelly Rush has had problems missing practice he has also lauded, lost an extreme amount of weight this year coming into the game this afternoon Kelly was down about 28 28 pounds from what he was at the start of the season which was a trouble point for Winnipeg versus this running game with Baltimore so Rush gets attention and Colin Scribner will have to come in to bolster that defensive line. Gerald Wilcox, Milt Stiegel conferring on the bench, anxious to get back on the field. Kelly Rush went off under his own steam. And here's a little swing pass to Tui Pelotu. And he's wrestled down by John Moten as he crossed midfield. Gain of close to seven. Well, that has been the feeling here at the stadium today, but these are the staunch Stallion fans. A healthy dose of skepticism in the city. Well, listen, the city has been bombarded with news stories about the Cleveland Browns coming here, and Mark Lee interviewed the owner, Jim Spiros, briefly 
in the third quarter about that situation. But the thing is, the NFL has used this city as a ploy for many years. And once again, the fans feel the same situation is coming about. But once again, they're going to be hit if they do try to bring a team in with a huge tax. And that's one of the things that the citizens are not too concerned about having. Not too wanting about having it again. Well, the citizens of Winnipeg know the feeling about losing a franchise and the roller coaster of emotions that can happen. Well, I tell you, it's been a roller coaster with Mike Pringle because he's been up and he's been down and he's been all around this Winnipeg defense this afternoon. 181 yards worth. Here's the quick toss, and they're calling that a forward pass. And it's right down our sight lines, James, and it was yeah, just yeah. lateral. Well, in it, fact, it, it looked like the wind actually... The wind actually did push it because he shoveled it real quick, and the wind caught it and tailed it in front of him. But other than that, it would have been a fumble. So he was very fortunate that he had the assistance of the wind on that play. It's raised havoc on a couple of field goals, but right here, it's an advantage for Baltimore. As you see the ball being pushed forward, and Pringle could not get to it to fell as an incompletion. If the wind's blowing the other way, that's a free football. Second and ten. Ham over the middle, and he has Gerald Alphen. And Shannon Garrett with the tackle, but Alphen, the former bomber with the big reception, to keep it alive for Baltimore, 6.24 to go. And that reception has to be especially sweet for Alphen to be able to catch it and keep the drive alive down at the 22-yard line. But it's a nice strike by Tracy Ham. He has the patience to sit in the pocket to allow Alphen to clear underneath. And first down was the result for Baltimore. Stallions in a position now to try and put this one away. 28-14 the lead, and the Bombers have to come up big on D. Mike Pringle. KD Williams, the stop. Pringle to the 17. Five more. You know, there's, there's a lot of heart in KD Williams, the outside linebacker for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. This guy's motor is running I'm full tilt all the time. You see him scraping off, making the tackle on Pringle, giving a little extra effort at the end of that play. But KD Williams, you can't do anything but admire his play at the linebacker position. Baltimore now over 200 yards rushing as a team in the game. Looking for Shannon Culver, incomplete. You know, you talked about Baltimore being over 200 yards as a team rush. They came into this game averaging 153 yards as a team on the ground, tops in the CFL, but over 200 yards in a playoff game, but controlling the clock, not allowing Winnipeg's offense the time to stay on the field, and the offensive line as well as the running backs doing a fine job of blocking up front not allowing Ham to feel the pressure. Carlos Huerta back on. John Moten has a knee down and is getting attention. On Thursday, November 9th, from 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. All Canadian linebacker in 92 and 93. Joined the Bombers late in the year. And he did that with the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Hamilton has had a rich history of great linebackers in that organization going back to the days of Zambiazzi and Ezrin and linebackers like that and Moten and now Michael O'Shea who we'll see in the second half of our doubleheader in that game in Calgary. Carlos Huerta from inside the 30 and he misses this to the left to keep the Bombers hopes alive. Puerta has been usually reliable this year, but fails to put away Winnipeg. It's a 15-point lead. Back at Memorial Stadium, 4.54 left, fourth quarter in this game, and then straight out to Calgary, where Earl Winfield and the Hamilton Tiger Cats get set to take on the 15-3 Calgary Stampeders led once again by Doug Flutie. Bombers, or check that the Stallions moved early. Did the Bombers draw them offside? Penalties all over the field. The importance of the missed field goal is Buttstein assesses the call against. Number 63, five-yard penalty. 
First down repeated. Chris Walby. Well, that old eagle eye of yours that called the hat trick earlier caught Winnipeg with the illegal procedure. But as you said, the importance of the missed field goal is an opportunity for Winnipeg to get back in this game. That three points would have been very devastating. But now it's only a 15-point lead. That's two touchdowns and one single point conversion and a two-point conversion. Here's Stiegel. Gets by Charles Anthony. And gets up to the 44. That's a yard shy of a first down for Milt Stiegel, who has become more of a factor in the second half. Well, you talk about him getting away from Charles Anthony on the play. Only one defensive back has played all the games this season for Baltimore, and that's Ken Watson. They've had a lot of movement in the secondary players in and out due to injury and other problems. Man, the Bombers will move the sticks with that run by Blaze Bryant. Bryant. Well, they have two starters from their Grey Cup finalist team that are out, Carl Anthony and Lester Smith in that Baltimore secondary. You know, and with Lester Smith being out also, that opened the doors for Charles Wright, the kick returner. Last year, Lester Smith led the, the CFL in average per punt return. He missed the season, gave Charles Wright an opportunity to set a CFL record for all-purpose yardage on kick return. You know, James, that Grant Carter's had a good afternoon. He was not with this Baltimore team last year in their run to the Cup, but uh, he's made some big plays today and another knockdown. Well, he joined the team late last year. He, ca he came in for the last regular season game last year and was on the team during the playoffs in Grey Cup. But this year he has emerged as a solid player defensively for them. He has stepped up. He's taken over one of those outside rush positions. He compliments Alfred Payton very well. They have a great balance there on their defensive front. Second and ten. Slack complete to Boyko. Boyko at the 51-yard line, and that looks like it should be a first down. They're spotting it at the 50, and that'll move the sticks. Now, this is where Baltimore has had problems the past couple of weeks. This defense only gives up 20 and a half points a game. Winnipeg has 14, but they're driving, and if they can make something happen, get down and get another touchdown on the board, we have a big football game going here. Sean Graham has checked in. Slack rolling. He'll have to take off with it, and Reggie Slack has another first down out of bounds with 2.53 to go. So the Bombers are not done yet. Three-minute warning to the two benches here in Baltimore. You can see the anxiety on the face of Bomber linebacker Calvin Smith. This is one proud franchise with 2.53 to go. These are the stakes for this team. They have not missed a division final since they came to the East in 1987. Chris? Well, they're not done yet. They trail by 15. 2.48 to go. First down, Bombers, and they've been on the move. Slack stands in, fires, incomplete. Matt Goodwin makes the defensive play. Gerald Wilcox, the intended receiver, and Gerald's had a few beefs in the second half. Well, he's felt that uh, the defense has been playing him a little close this afternoon, but a great effort by last year's Rookie of the Year, Matt Goodwin, to get that right hand in there and deflect the ball at the last instant. Nice defensive play. Nice slow-mo, too. Well, Reggie Slack has got it going. In this fourth quarter against the win. Second down and that behind Wilcox incomplete. And now Winnipeg down to third and Slack's ten. Passing completed. They're down to it, but Slack took a beating in the pocket. He was hit just as he released that ball and it forced him to throw it behind Win Wilcox. But you have to go for it here. It's third and ten. Wilcox had the inside release. Slack threw the ball behind him. He was open, but now you have to gamble on third and ten. How many times have we seen that today where that ball veers right? It gets that into tail the on it. Mark Lee talked about it yesterday that the ball tails into this wind. Mark's a former quarterback. That's why he got out of the way when the ball came to him on the sideline. All down to this for the Bombers. Slack to Wilcox. Flag down. That's the proper call, too, because Watson was draped all over Wilcox. The flag came late, but it was the proper call by the officials, and it will keep the drive moving for the Bombers. 2.31 to go. Unintentional forward pass interference. Baltimore number 33, 10-yard penalty, first down, Winnipeg. I've always been confused with that intentional and unintentional. If it's an interference, it's interference.
First down and 10, Winnipeg. Well, Cal Murphy's team has another life. Down by 15, but now down to the Baltimore 26-yard line. Reggie has time, looking into the end zone, overthrowing Daniel. Reggie Flanks pass is complete. And the situations are getting shorter and shorter for Winnipeg. The pressure now is starting to arrive. It's like I understand the urgency of going into the end zone, but you also need to keep the sticks moving. And when he was getting rid of the ball early, he was having a lot of success. The three to five step drops. When he goes back and try to hold it for something to cut clear deep, he hasn't been accurate this afternoon. He's had most of his success in the second half with Wilcox and Stiegel. Throw back, and here's Bryant. And look at the pursuit to the football. Bryant got across the 25, but no more than three. Grant Carter, Charles Anthony moved up, and you just saw a blue wave going at Bryant. There was a host of blue jerseys showing up at the football. That's the pursuit. That's what his defense was built upon, was speed. They employ seven defensive backs. Two of them play the linebacker position, and it's very hard to move laterally on this football team. And now, another third down. Slack over the middle, it's picked up, Tracy Gravely. And Tracy Gravely's gonna take it home. Blaze Bryant trying to track him down, no sir, touchdown, Baltimore. And what a fitting way to put the capper on a defensive performance this afternoon. The team's most outstanding defensive player and leading tackler for the past two seasons, Tracy Gravely, picking off one, taking it back 95 yards for the winning touchdown this afternoon to put the, the margin of victory on the board to put the Winnipeg Blue Bombers away. You'll see right here as Slack just lasers and up Gravely goes up, deflects the ball, has enough presence and poise to pull it in, but off to the races. He is off to the races, and those big offensive linemen are the only thing between he and the goal line, and he was not to be caught from behind by Bryant. Carlos Huerta, that's the extra point. And the extra point, Bryant, is good. Well, Reggie Slack had the offense moving in this fourth quarter. They cashed in on one third down conversion, but Tracy Gravely's put an exclamation mark on a Baltimore win in this Southern semi. Chris, there were two points in the game that we touched upon early in the first quarter when they had the interception and they didn't capitalize. They came away with only a single off of the missed field goal attempt by Westwood, but the Allen Boyko missed opportunity in the end zone in the third quarter when Slack had him deep behind coverage and he overthrew the football and they missed once again. Those are the two key points in this game that turned it around for Winnipeg. They had an opportunity to pick up 14 points. They came away with only four points and that that point, a field goal would have possibly won it in this opportunity if they had picked up those two touchdowns. Don Matthews on patrol at the Baltimore sidelines, the Stallions will play host to the South Final next week. Minute 52 to go. Remember, we used to do Colts, C-O-L-T-S, and now they've got the Stallions version of the famous Baltimore cheer here at Memorial Stadium. Take him a while to spell that one out, though. <laughs> he needs to be a big wheel for that. Robert Clark shaken up and down. Don't know what happened to Clark. They just ran out for the kickoff alignment. Looked like he might have caught a cramp. They're working on his left calf when he went out on the field. And this guy, I mean, he's a brave individual. He has on those short pants, no jacket, and you're sitting here the whole game with your hands in your pocket. He's tough enough to play because it's it feels like Winnipeg here. <laughs> Got the wind going, nice chill in the air. 
Now, it's a little warmer than Winnipeg. I was down on the field last week in Winnipeg, and it was awfully cold. It was starting to ice up late in the game, and Troy Westwood had some problems with his footing on a field goal attempt. Mike Pringle, along with Char Pordonis, two of the outstanding players in the CFL last season and this season also. Pringle was the runner-up to Doug Flutie for the outstanding player. Pordonis, the outstanding lineman in the league. Actually, Chris Walby, not Chris Walby, but Rocco Romano was his opponent in that situation. But a fine job done in their second year here in Baltimore, improving on what was an exceptional ball club in 94 has become an even better ball club in 95. 12 and 6 last year, 15 and 3 this season. 8 and 1 on home turf going into the game and looks like they'll have another home game next week. Milt Stiegel over the 35 to the 38. Well, this has been a trying year for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. You consider all the injuries you talked about. 75 players have been through the Bomber dressing room this year. Cal Murphy has finally found a quarterback to replace Matt Dunnigan and Reggie Slack. He thinks he has a future CFL star in Shannon Baker, who was injured in the game against Calgary. He's retooled the defense with some exciting new linebackers like KD Williams. They'll be reloading and tougher than ever next year. And he's going to get Clark and Randolph back also. Reggie Slack to Blaze Bryant through his hands. And Douglas Kraft makes some pay. They're ruling the ball hit the ground. The Stallions thought they had another interception. That's going to be awful close. We probably get an opportunity to look at it on replay, but Alfred Payton hustling, but the hit on Blaze Bryant. Watch as Bryant tries to make this reception here as Kraft comes up and just puts that helmet under the chin. That's, brought, that's called bringing the bone right there because he laid him out and sits there and gloats over him. And the ball caromed off Kraft and Alfred Payton thought he had an interception. Well, the celebration's underway. Reggie Slack, 213 second half yards of passing. And he'll try to add to that total and has Daniels up over center field at the 52. A minute 23 to go. Well, what you get now is Baltimore playing a prevent defense, so they're going to allow Slack to throw passes underneath, and they're going to protect against anything deep. No, the Stallions were outscored in the fourth quarter this year. The only quarter they were outscored in, but they never squandered a third quarter lead. They were 11-0 when leading after three quarters. So what that tells you is, well, if they were outscored, they were giving up points when they were well ahead. Yeah, you know, when you built up big leads, a lot of times players will get a little relaxed, and, and that's the situation that Baltimore was in for the most part this season. Having 15 victories, you're normally going to have a lead going into the fourth quarter. Reggie Slack dumps it off. There's Bryant underneath, and he'll step out. First down, 107 to go. Black pass complete to but it's 36 14. And it comes down to too little, too late. These are the things, these are the type of patterns that Reggie needed to be running in the first half and in the third quarter, getting rid of the ball early not gambling, taking all of the uh, underneath no. stuff, because if you start nickel and diming, you can wear down a defense, and they just didn't wear down this Baltimore defense this afternoon. Again, Calgary coming up against the Ticats of Hamilton at McMahon Stadium. Daniel in the flat again, steps out. That took five seconds. Black pass complete to Tim Daniel. Reggie Slack well over 300 yards a game passing this week, but again, it was the first yeah, half when they let this the one play. get Second too down. far out of their reach that the it, offense couldn't move the football. And those two opportunities, you can't talk about them enough. They're going to haunt the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. The missed opportunity off the first turnover of the game and the missed touchdown where Boyko had gotten behind coverage. Second and short yardage and that little flip toss inside plays Bryant. Driving down to the seven yard line. 53 seconds left in this Southern Semi tomorrow. It'll be Birmingham in San Antonio. Sharp Danish 
part of that great offensive line that opened so many holes again for Mike Pringle today. Mike Withicombe, Nick Supis. Slack into the end zone, and that's knocked down. Charles Anthony was there defensively for the Stallions. I think one of the things with this drive here that the Winnipeg Blue Bombers are trying to get into the end zone, this is the pride of this Blue Bomber organization to never quit, to never give up. They haven't often been in this type of situation coming into the playoffs with a losing record, only 7-11 and 11 this season. And actually, this game, they came in with their first back-to-back -back victories of the season. So they had a two-game win streak that's going to come to an end this afternoon. But they're trying to punch this one in, which they just did to Wilcox for their third, second major of the afternoon and an opportunity, hopefully, to have something to build on next season. Gerald Wilcox, his second touchdown of the game on the 50th pass by Reggie Slack, 29 of 50. And now 356 yards of passing offense. Gerald's on the limp after the major score. And you see him just on the quick square out, and that's a very nice ball by Slack. I mean, a nice tight spiral. It was in a place where only Wilcox could get to the ball, but another concern you spoke about earlier, Chris, Baltimore squandering fourth quarter points. And the extra Westwood point adds the extra good. point. Wilcox, seven catches, 85 yards, and two touchdowns. And Cal Murphy's team now trailing 36 to 21. Baltimore is going to go on to win this game, but that's going to have to be a concern for them next week. Whoever their opponent may be, San Antonio or Birmingham, they had a great shootout down in San Antonio last week, 42 to 48, San Antonio came out on the top end of that score, but those are two teams that can put a lot of points on the scoreboard. Kelvin Simmons came in and did a great job for Birmingham, putting five touchdowns, two by the pass, three via the run, and that's going to be a great shootout we'll look forward to tomorrow in San Antonio. Man, if you're looking ahead, Baltimore beats San Antonio 50-24 to and 28-23 in back-to-back -back games back in July. They beat Birmingham 36 to 8. And a reminder, coming up right after the conclusion of our game, they're getting set to go at McMahon Stadium, the Thai Cats and the Stampeders. Pee Wee Smith, one of those great receivers in that Calgary passing attack that possesses Dave Sapunjas, Terry Vaughn, Allen Pitts, Vince Danielson. Just a fine group of receivers and Tony Smith coming out of the backfield. So the Stallions will be the heavy favorites again next week, regardless of who Don Matthews will face, because they were 2-0 against San Antonio, 2-0 against Birmingham, although those games came much earlier in the season. They were very early in the season, and before both of those teams had an opportunity to really get their lineup set, San Antonio has been 8-1 and one in their last nine games, and they're a very powerful offensive team, and quarterback David Archer actually was the efficiency leader in the CFL this year. The short kick fielded by Chris Wright to maintain possession for Baltimore, and so Reggie Slack won't be able to go back. You know, a point I wanted to touch on, and I never got a chance to say it, is we look at Slack's passes today, tying a record of Tobin Rote for 50 passes in a game. Bob Cameron played in his 25th playoff game this afternoon, which put him in seventh place all time in the CFL. You know, 33 of those attempts came here in the second half as Winnipeg played catch up. 33 seconds to go. Tracy Ham will just eat up the rest of the clock. Well, it's been a fine job of a fine day at the office for Tracy Ham this afternoon. He mixed the run and pass very well this afternoon, but Tracy Ham didn't put himself in any situations that it would cause him some problems. He kept himself very alert and very aware of his position on the field. He was able to march his team down when he had an opportunity from turnovers to get points out of it for his offense. Well, it was really a typical ham day on the season. 10 of 19, 215 yards. 
You know, as Tracy Ham has matured more and more as a CFL quarterback, years back they always looked for him to throw the ball and run. He, he was a great runner. He's had 2,000, two back-to-back 1,000-yard -back rushing season as a quarterback. But being here in Baltimore, they have developed an offense that he fits into very well. Mike Pringle, a great running back, a great offensive line in front of him. And Tracy Ham has gotten better as he's gotten older. Winnipeg used its last time out. Mike Pringle will try and fatten the stats as he got outside again. Down to the 36. 14 seconds left. But what he did, he stayed in bounds on that play. He didn't run out of bounds. He wanted to keep the clock moving because this game is all but the zeros coming up on the play clock, and we have a penalty and a fight breaking out. K.D. Williams mixing it up now with a couple of Baltimore players. With that rush, Pringle would have gone over 200 yards rushing today, but again, flags are down. Well, I think the rush is going to stand because the ball is at the 35, so Pringle will get his 200 yard for the day. 202 on 26 rushes, an outstanding performance by Mike Pringle, but you have to take your hat off to his offensive line for creating those gaping holes up front. And Katie Williams is going to get an early shower by a few seconds on the west rest of Winnipeg. Rough play disqualification. Winnipeg 44. Well, his teammates will be in behind him in 14 seconds. And they'll all be frustrated, but an outstanding game today by Baltimore in their second season in the CFL, once again, getting through a first-round playoff game. Last year, it was Toronto here at Memorial Stadium when the Argos came in and played a good first half of football, but Baltimore was able to just wear down the Argos as they've done with the Blue Bombers this afternoon and take advantage of having those huge and great athletes in front of them and just marching up and down the field. Well, Mike Pringle in some pretty nice company here. Skip Walker has the playoff record, but Pringle, the fourth highest total in playoff history, and it may be better than that before the day is done. Look at him push his blockers out of bounds. And Pringle is out. Seven seconds left on the clock, and it looks like Baltimore wants to put more points on the board. Well, I think what they're going to have to do is bring that font back up and put him in the third slot. But great effort once again by Mike Pringle. You really can't just... The, there it is. It came in. Hey, <laughs> you go, <asked> George. <laughs> George Cootie, our font coordinator right there, ever so quick with the keyboards. But Mike Pringle, I mean, you really can't judge the heart and determination of this young man Play after play, every time he gets, gets the ball, seems like he's stronger and stronger. And here in the waning seconds of this ball game, he is still fighting for <laughs> extra yardage. Well, I know he was losing balance, but he just tossed a 300-pounder aside. Get out of my way. Mike Whitcomb, who is this year's Eastern nominee, Northern nominee for most out, Southern nominee for most outstanding off of the line. I'll get it right sooner or later. Well, it used to be East and West. Pringle put the ball on the turf here, and Winnipeg gets it. But this one is one second away from finishing. And that's hardly going to spoil the afternoon for the brilliance of Mike Pringle. John Moten a little slow to get up. Well, Don Matthews' team en route to its 11th consecutive win. Well, Reggie Slack will probably come in and throw one more pass, and he'll break the record for, 51, for 50 attempts in the game. It would be his 51st first attempt if he puts one more pass in the air. Not the type of way that you want to break a record, but you'll have to give Reggie Slack the praise for being able to accomplish that feat this afternoon. Well, Pringle will be the main topic of conversation amongst the defense of the opponents next week, getting ready for Baltimore, either Birmingham or San Antonio. Last play of this South Semi, and Reggie Slack throws it out, incomplete. Charles Anthony knocks it down, and away we go. Blaze Bryant took a shot at somebody. And this one's not going to end without a share of hard feelings. Well, it can't end on a defensive penalty also, but it's a very hard-fought game by both sides. And 
you really have to take your hat off the Baltimore team that has improved from an outstanding team last season in 1994 to become even a better team in 1995. And to serve notice on the rest of the Southern Division, the road to the Great Cup goes through Baltimore. So two former assistants on the Eskimo staff. Cal Murphy was the offensive coordinator. Don Matthews, the defensive coordinator. And it was great defense today that led to a 36-21 victory for Don Matthews and the Baltimore Stallions. Well, if there was any weakness on the Baltimore team today, it might have been in the passing attack where the numbers weren't great, but they were efficient numbers. Tracy Ham did what he had to do offensively. He did not gamble. He nickeled and dimed his way down the field. He kept his team in great field position, and he was able to put points on the board when we needed. Let's go down to Mark Lee. Thank you, Chris. We're on the field here with Mike Pringle, the player of this game. Mike, uh, at last count, we had you 227 yards rushing. What a day's work. Yeah, I, I didn't realize I had that many yards. Um, we came out here, we were excited to, uh, to get after it. You know, everybody came with their game face on, and we showed it today. Um, I'd just like to thank all the fans that showed up out here. Baltimore has the best fans in the CFL. Mike, you also scored two touchdowns today on the ground. We're going to show the fans a replay of the second. Tell us all about it. Uh, which one? The first one or the second, second one? Second one. <laughs> the second one was a... a, a no, no, it, it, was right a, just, it was right at the middle. It was a belly play, and... Um, Neil Fort and Neil Fort blew his man out, and I just kind of um, snuck in between the guard and the tackle, uh, straight ahead play, and that's where I love to run the ball, right in between the tackles. Well, you had all kinds of room on first down throughout the game. Congratulations. Good luck in the division final. Thank you very much. The Baltimore Stallions win convincingly over the Winnipeg Blue Bombers 36-21.